This channel is part of the History Hit Network. This is Abbey Door Court, where 12 months ago Ruth Watson came to the aid of the derelict mansion. When I first came to Abbey Door Court, the house was in a really dire state. But the problem was that Caris owned the property, but Claire, granddaughter, wanted to sort it out and to make something of it. Do you think your grandmother's got confidence in you? Sometimes I question it. I do if you not do know. not know those figures, I am Jack Spratt. I'm back at Abbey Door Court to see whether anything did happen after the building work was finished. Is this house trading and who's running it? And do you have authority, your grandchildren, or do you still have to run things past your grandma? Harris Ward fell in love with Abbey Door Court over 40 years ago. She sold her small farm in Warwickshire and bought the estate for £12,000. It is a very special place. The whole atmosphere here is totally different to anywhere that I've ever been to before. And I think that's where its strength lies. A passionate horticulturalist, 81-year-old Caris has single-handedly cultivated a stunning garden out of the surrounding fields. Her creation attracts visitors from all over the country. Caris brought up her three children in the main house. But ten years ago, when the property became too much to manage, she moved out into a smaller cottage on the grounds. This is warm for a start. Having always lived in very cold houses, the feeling of being warm is quite surprising. Left empty and unloved, Abbey Door Court is falling into disrepair. Houses can withstand anything. Houses will rise from the ashes if they're going to. Caris's granddaughter, Claire Sage, is passionate about Abbey Door Court. She and siblings Hannah and Julian grew up with their parents in the old servants' quarters. Claire's parents now live away, but the siblings, all in their 20s, still live on the estate. But it's Claire who has a strong affinity with the house. I can't explain what it is about the house and living here that I just, I can't bear to see it, how it is and how it's falling apart. Claire still lives in the servants' quarters and works as a hospital administrator. But it's her dream to give up her job and devote herself to restoring the mansion to its former glory. My goal in life now is to make the house work and to make it a business and a home. Grandmother Caris insists she's happy to take a back seat. I don't really mind what happens to the house as long as it doesn't intrude on the garden. I can't wait to back out, you know. <laughs> but as head of the family, Caris very much oversees proceedings. And if Claire's to get her wish, she'll have to convince her grandmother that she's up to the job. We do differ, but we have discussions and well, some of the things she says I don't agree with and some of the things I say she can't see that would work. In a bid to win her grandmother over, Claire's called in renowned hotelier and businesswoman Ruth Watson to help save the crumbling pile. Ruth's come to Herefordshire to meet Claire. She receives a warm welcome, albeit under a rather precarious porch. Hi there. <laughs> Hello. Are we safe? Just about, yes. <laughs> I'm Ruth. I'm Claire, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, although I think we could find some better surroundings Definitely, than this. Yes. I think this kind of defines dilapidation, doesn't yes, it? Oh, Let's go in. Yeah. Let's go in. <laughs> Ruth discovers that part of the house is already being redecorated and the ornate plaster mouldings restored. So, what's going on here, Claire? What are all these... We had um, a horrible water leak in the drawing room and the bedroom above, a mains pipe burst. So we had water just pouring through. So um, luckily we're all insured, so we're having all the work redone at the moment. But the insurance money will only pay for the rooms affected by the leak. Financing the rest is up to the family. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. We've got unrivaled access to the world's leading historians with hundreds of documentaries featuring everything from Boudicca to the British royal family. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. 
Sign up now for a free trial, and Real Royalty fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use code REALROYALTY at checkout. The house might be in a bad state of repair, but Claire is still lost in the romance of Abbey Door Court. This is the drawing room just in here. Oh! <laughs> now, this isn't a small room. <laughs> no, this is definitely the main feature. This is One lovely. Of the main what a beautiful room. This was just a lovely kind of family room, really. It had lots of kind of sofas and chairs. We had a rocking horse in the window. Normally one wouldn't think this, but the pipes bursting mean that you were able to make an insurance claim. It was a blessing in disguise, actually. It was yeah. horrendous when it happened, and to see the, the damage that it caused was just unbearable. But now it's just so exciting coming in here and just seeing it and imagining how it's going to look like when it's finished. Claire realises that this is a good opportunity to get the whole house up and running if she can persuade her grandmother to help. Just watch your step as yes. you come out here. It's very simple. Cool, this is slightly overgrown. Here's my grandmother, hard at work. <laughs> she certainly is. <laughs> Hello, Hello. how to meet you? you. It's my grandmother. I'm, yes, and you're Karis. Yes, I'm Karis. Karis, yes. very good to meet you. And what an enormous effort you must put into this garden. It's so labour-intensive. It is very labour-intensive, I suppose, but um, it's not too bad. The gardens are looking in very good array and the house looks in desperate straits. Did you feel that you deliberately abandoned it or that no, you just... No, no, no it's no. never been abandoned. It kind of, in a way, we just left it be. You know, cause but it wasn't be abandoned. No, no, I think it's been easy to kind of close doors and it's left on for time. With Caris now in her 80s, the return of three grandchildren to Abbey Door Court is something of a blessing. Did you expect all the grandchildren to come back? No, never. So what would you have done? What I'm doing now. Which is? Living here and doing the garden. And then the rest of it would have just... Well, something would have turned up, I expect. Caris and Claire have conflicting priorities regarding the estate. Ruth's keen to find out what Claire's brother Julian makes of it all. So the neutrality, possibly, of your... Grandmother, lack of enthusiasm, if I'm, you know, taking it a step further, about the house is actually in direct contrast to how you feel about the house. I think that's how it works well, is that I'm so enthusiastic about it. My future is bringing the house back to how it was. And, Jules, you lean more towards your grandmother's love of the land. I would say so, yeah. 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 But if all could be kept together and all could be enjoyed together, yeah, that's in the hope, harmony. That we can all have our own roles and, and work together. That would be lovely. So we've each got our own Everyone projects, would be own happy. Work. Karis, even you? Uh, even me, but I shan't be here that much longer, shall I, hopefully. Oh, I wouldn't count yourself <laughs> out now. That's the thing about gardeners, you know, they tend to go on a long time. The problem is, who's going to take ultimate responsibility and put a stop to the rot at Abbey Door Court? The one thing I'm absolutely certain of is that Karis really loves the garden, loves the landscape, and the house doesn't mean too much to her, and that Claire really loves the house. And it's just as well that somebody does, because I think it is going to be down to the grandchildren to make this work. Rescuing Abbey Door Court from ruin is a massive undertaking. It would make a beautiful bedroom, but there has to be some investment here. And Ruth crosses swords with Karis. I don't believe you. Come on, come oh, on. Listen, I don't know. The history of Abbey Door Court in Herefordshire stretches back to the 12th century, when it is said to have provided accommodation for the nearby Door Abbey. The stable yard was built in the 17th century, when the house became a coaching inn. Today, the estate has 140 acres of prime land and an exquisite garden on the banks of the River Dore. The centrepiece of the estate is this charming mansion. These grand rooms with their fine mouldings and handsome facade were added to the existing house in 1857. Claire Sage wants to see the deserted house restored dreams of giving up her job to run it commercially. But she needs to convince her grandmother, Caris Ward, that she can manage a viable business here. 
Currently, the annual income is just £2,000, generated from opening the gardens for five months of the year and from the tea room. But it's not nearly enough if the house is to survive. Claire still lives in the old servants' quarters where she was brought up as a child. She's called on businesswoman Ruth Watson to help secure the house's future. It's interesting because other people would be more selfish. They would want to be in this part of the house and, you know, hang that bit. I've always been in that half of the house. My grandmother had this half and we came in for kind of family occasions and things like that. So it's always been very separate. <laughs> sweet. It's sweet. And the kitchens. Come on, Just we're on our way to the kitchens, weren't we? The house hasn't been lived in for around ten years, but Claire has warm memories of her childhood here. This is one of the kitchens here. Now, isn't that strange? One always <laughs> expects an aga to be piping hot, not frigid cold. Yeah, very much used to be. It was always kind of, this was the centre of the house when we were younger. We used to sit here as children, all leaning up against the aga, with my grandmother in the chair there, my mum there, and then kind of Sunday night TV on in the corner, and the dogs around us. It doesn't feel that way now, does it? No, it's not. It's a, I don't like being in this room so much now. It's nowhere near what it was like when we were small. No. It's not fair on the house that it's going to this state at the moment. I just think if we can bring it back and people can come and enjoy it. I think that's the main thing that I want for the house, definitely. Claire has already started making some income by opening a tea room in the old stables. It's a very popular feature with visitors to her grandmother's garden. But even with these two revenues combined, it's not nearly enough to pay for the upkeep of the house. Ruth sets off on her own to find out what potential the rest of the estate has to offer. She starts in the menage, once used for exercising horses. It's the most fantastic space, and if you got rid of the tractors and logs and put them into one of the other outbuildings, how about this for an indoor market or a permanent retail space? I mean, it's such a waste not to be used. Ruth is also convinced that the house itself has money-making potential. In such a picture-perfect location, the property could make an ideal guest house. But it will take upwards of £150,000 to restore the mansion. You know, one thing about this house is there isn't a rotten view out of any window. It is so beautifully situated. But this room is above the drawing room and it's where the damage occurred from, through the roof and it's lost all its cornicing. It would make a beautiful bedroom, but there has to be some investment here. And my view is that while the whole of the house needs redoing, and certainly the upstairs bedrooms, you might as well go the whole hog and actually make, if not all the bedrooms en suite, at least a number of them. Because if this is going to trade in any capacity, it's got to look rather better than it does now. <laughs> As a successful hotelier, Ruth knows that guests looking for a country house retreat demand a high standard of accommodation. I can actually see daylight through there. The county of Herefordshire is a popular tourist destination with a calendar full of annual festivals and events. It's home to the world famous Hay on Wye Book Festival which attracts 75,000 visitors every year. Accommodation during an event like this is in high demand. Ruth's on her way to the Old Vicarage, a local B&B that capitalises on such tourism. Like Abbey Door, it was once dilapidated, but has been lovingly restored and turned into a successful B&B by Paul Gerard and John McCall. Hello, Paul. Hi. And hello, I'm John. Nice John. To hello, you. and I'm Ruth. And what a very handsome house you have. Yes. And staggering views. Staggering views and a staggering George yeah. Cook vicarage. Paul and John bought the house in 1997 for 240,000 pounds, and spent a further 150,000 pounds lovingly restoring it. It's wonderful with the dual aspect. It's a really beautiful room. Yes, it's lovely, isn't it? Was it in a really parlour state or? It was very much unloved. Yeah. And this room took 16 weeks of work, for example. Really? Yes. Um, so a lot of investment in time. Uh, and dare I ask, money? Yes, just a little bit. But we didn't keep too close a tab <laughs> <laughs> if we wanted to remain sane. But was it tens of thousands to restore? Yes. Oh, it must have been, yes. Something you loved doing? 
Yes, you have to um, enjoy meeting people, you have to enjoy being with people. It is very hard work, but the rewards, financial and otherwise, are, are enormous. The old vicarage has fewer bedrooms than Abbey Door Court. Rates are £100 per night, and with a high occupancy it brings in enough money to support the business. Having done her research, Ruth's even more convinced that Abbey Door can operate as a successful business. She's back to share her findings with Caris and Claire. Hello, how are you? Thank you. Claire, full marks for asking for help, I have to say that, because I do think the house is in a pretty parlour state. You know, I know you've had the damp problems which have been caused by pipes, but I do think there is actually quite a lot of work that needs to be done here, because if this house is going to trade, I'm afraid the standards need to be raised. First, Ruth has a money-making idea for the menage. If you could actually have a monthly event that wasn't just about produce, but was about everything to do with crafts, local craftspeople coming here, food producers for sure, but everything that anyone wanted to sell, because you've got that amazing space, the menage. The benefit for you is that you charge rent for the, the stalls. You get an uptrade because you've got the tea room there and if you were to provide light lunches as well, so much the better. I think you should have a stall yourself selling cakes and all the wonderful things people like to buy and go away and scoff. We've got plant cells already, so you can add to your plant cells. And of course, people can go into the gardens as well. Next, Ruth turns her attention to accommodation. With several B&Bs in the village, she's worked out that Abbey Door Court could turn over around £60,000 a year, providing an income of at least £30,000. What I think the house could be turned into is a five-bedroom, mostly ensuite guest house. With the place that I went to, they only have three bedrooms. They have fabulous views, but the house is no nicer than this, and the bedrooms are a lot smaller than these would be. They are charging £100 per night. They are about 85% occupancy full the year round. And they are making enough money for two people to live quite happily off the earnings and, and to keep investing back into the house. If you could see that your whole family, your grandchildren, would be able to live here, enjoy this house, this estate, this garden, and all get a living from it, is that something that you think that you might be prepared to do, to help? Well, obviously, somehow or another, we've got to find money to mm. do it. There's no doubt about that. Mm. What I do know is that there is a shortage of accommodation in Herefordshire and that you do have the most extraordinary amount of happenings going on, from food and literary festivals to, you know, the, the place is teeming with events. It's just wonderful. And I, I don't think you'll have any problem filling. I really don't. I quite like the idea. <laughs> do you? Yeah. It's going to be the, the hardest for you. But if the family is to make a success of a business, they'll have to decide how they manage the project. How do you feel about merging with the others and, you know, everybody benefiting? I think we need to talk about that, yes. definitely. Finally, Ruth leaves Claire with some homework. Now, before my next visit, I'd like to charge you with some activities. I think, Claire, you need to go and look at b and to see how they do it. I think it would be very encouraging and inspirational. And I'd also like to see if we could do a trial of this internal farmer's market stroke trading area in the menage. Mm. It's a brilliant space. And I think if you could set that up with stallholders coming to sell their wares, let's see how it works. I think it could be a real success. I really think that if this family all pulls together in the way that it can do, because you're all strong, determined, hard-working people, I think this is really attainable, the idea that Abbey Door Court is sustainable, that the family can all live here together and the family can all prosper here. To make any change at Abbey Door, Claire realises that her grandmother needs to be on board. The b, &B idea is definitely something that's come up in the past, but... I don't know, I never really got... I think because my grandmother said, um, not really. We all just can't, we all know that won't happen. Let's move on to the next thing. But Ruth knows that to make a success here, 
the next generation needs to be given the opportunity. Although her grandmother didn't think she would like the idea of running a B&B, Claire actually said, yes, she would love doing it. But there's a long way to go because this family have now got to sit down and talk to each other about who does what. They've got to create some kind of proper strategy that will work long term. And above all, there's got to be some funding found from somewhere. Ruth thinks it's important for Claire to experience the B&B industry for herself, despite Karis's concerns over this as a future for Abbey Door. Saturday, 7 a.m., and Claire's at Hanover House in Cheltenham. It's a smaller property than Abbey Door Court, but requires just as much work. Claire's here to assist owners James and Veronica Ritchie. Got um, two cooked breakfasts, five scrambled eggs and smoked salmon and one poached egg. Have you ever cooked scrambled eggs? Um, more microwaves from my university days. There's tomatoes and mushrooms to go on. Making breakfast for six guests might appear easy, but it requires a lot of planning and organisation. Is it one scrambled egg? The tea room seems very easy right now <laughs> compared to running this. Two more to come down, is that right? Okay, that looks lovely. Here we go. Thank okay. you. It takes Veronica almost four hours to prepare, cook, serve and clear breakfast. And then it's time to move on to the bedrooms. Um, just check the teapot. All this has to be replenished, washed and brought back for the new guests. So I'll do this, then you and Anna will strip the beds, remake them. How long does it take to do everything in the room? I would think you're looking at a good hour. Easy. On top of this, there's cleaning, laundry and ironing. Even with help, this would be a full day's work for Claire at Abbey Door. Yeah, right. Nice Keep in touch. Sophie. Claire's arduous shift has made her realise that working in the hospitality business is tough. Incredible experience, really enjoyed it. It was really good to come and done that and just to see how much work there really is, what their day is really. And then I'll take it back to the family and we'll go from there really. If Claire's to achieve her dream of running Abbey Door Court as a business, she must prove that she's got what it takes. Do you think your grandmother's got confidence in you? Sometimes I question it. But it's not going to be easy. She's the one that stirred it up and started it. Abbey Door Court in Herefordshire is in trouble. Claire Sage has drafted in Ruth Watson to save the family home from dereliction. I've lived here my whole life, 27 years. It's horrible to see something you love just deteriorate like that. But Ruth faces two obstacles. The house requires a massive cash injection and needs to earn its keep. It's Claire's ambition to run the house as a B&B, &B, and successful hotelier Ruth thinks it's a concept that could work. But Claire's grandmother, Caris Ward, is less convinced. Well, from my point of view, I could think of nothing more ghastly, but I'm a bit worried about what Claire might be landed with. <laughs> As well as opening as a B&B, &B, Ruth wants the family to consider alternative revenue streams. She suggested they utilise the outbuildings at Abbey Door and trial a farmer's market in the menage. But Grandmother Caris is sceptical. I think there are too many farmer's markets. There are so many. And yes, I think a farmer's market is not the thing to do here, really. Claire's pulled out all the stops to arrange today's market, but there's one thing that she hasn't been able to organise. In view of the weather, I don't think it's going to go very well, and I think people will be put off from leaving their homes. And Caris remains lukewarm about the event. I really have no feelings about it. I mean, it'll either work or it won't. And we need some cutlery um, napkins and all that on the tables, and all the crisps can come out now as well. Despite Claire's optimism, the bad weather means a poor turnout. Don't know how I feel. I'm just uh, quite exhausted from it all. Yeah, you learn things and learn for next time. After years of decay, it's finally dawned on the family that drastic action is required. Over the summer, they struggle to agree on a solution to Abbey Door's predicament. 
they finally agree to pool their savings to raise the £150,000 needed to finance restoration. But as they procrastinate, the house continues to languish. It's four months since Ruth's last visit, and she's back to find out what progress has been made at Abidor Court. Well, nothing much has changed here. The ceiling's still falling down. It's still being propped up. Ruth discovers from Claire that it's not just a financial plan that the family have decided on. When I last met with you all and I was suggesting the house should be a b and is that happening or not happening? Yeah, we've, we've looked into it um, and we've just kind of got quite stuck on it. The, the money we need to raise to kind of set ourselves up as a and b um, we just can't meet that money at the moment. And also the work involved running a b and um, it's just, we just don't think that's the right thing for us at the moment. So where are you going? We're looking at weekly and weekend rental, self-catering, self to come and have the house for the, the time they want it. So I think there's a whole raft of things that are required for weekly rentals that would actually probably come in more expensive. The other consideration is that weekly rentals tend to only take place in school holiday times at Christmas, Easter, whereas B&B, &B, I mean, it runs throughout the year, and this is such an ideal spot. So I'm quite surprised that, you know, the family seem to have made that decision. With the whole family now investing in the project, Claire's found her ambitions for the family home relegated to the back burner. At one point, this was your baby entirely, and then it started to be chipped away at by the members of the family. I mean, have you gone through a painful curve at all on this? Yeah, it's been, it's been hard, but that's life, and you've got to keep moving forward. It's been, it's been an emotional couple of months, definitely. Do you think your grandmother's got confidence in you? Sometimes I question it, but I did get carried away, I know I did, but then I think, yeah, it was my dream and it still is, but it's just on a different level now, I think, so. With a proposal to convert the house into a holiday let and Claire now out of the driving seat, Ruth wants to talk to Caris and get to the heart of the matter. Claire wanted things to happen, didn't she? I mean, yes. Claire was... she's the one that stirred it up and started it. So you Claire... never had any intention of letting her just come and do her well, own thing clearly here. she couldn't have done it. No one person can do this mm. on their own. I think it would be an absolute nightmare for her mm. with the tea room in the garden mm. and a B&B. &B. Mm. And I think it is ideal as a country house, really. Mm. The, this just seemed to happen. So you, you think there's less work involved than um, running it as a B&B? &B? Oh, I think so, yes. Yeah. My worry about it being um, used for uh, families is, is how many, much the facilities would still need to be done to the same standards as the B&B, &B, but the, the cash flow wouldn't be as great. We'd have to wait and see. Concerned about the direction the project is taking, Ruth calls Caris, Claire and siblings Julian and Hannah to a meeting as she's still convinced that running a B&B &B at Abbey Door Court is the way forward. At this present time in our lives, we don't have the time to run a B&B. &B. You don't, because you've got a full-time job, but Claire has got, originally also got a full-time job, and Hannah has and a full-time job. And if I can remind you, Claire said at the beginning she wanted to leave her full-time job in order to devote her attention and time here. Now, if the remit has completely changed, and I suspect it has completely changed, I am superfluous to any decision making here and nobody's going to listen to a word I say that is absolutely fine that is completely your prerogative to do so right but I have completely wasted my time because I actually do know what I'm talking about when it comes to B&B &B, weddings events what have you that is my business has been it for 25 years I actually do know what I'm talking about frustrated by the lack of progress Ruth is beginning to wonder if the family will ever make any headway at Abidor have you ever heard of a committee who actually come to a good decision? We haven't got a committee. We do it as a family and we all go along as a family and, and we just harmoniously jog along and I hope it'll work. If this has all been harmonious, every bit of the discussion, then I will lay all my worldly possessions that that is not the truth because nothing in a family is ever harmonious from top to bottom. I'm not trying to put dissension in the way of this. I'm trying to put practical aims and needs in the way of this. Ruth's stern words appear to have done some good. 
Oh, that's right. Julian, Hannah and Claire make a start on clearing out 40 years of detritus. Nice. <laughs> and renovation begins on the house. Abbey Door Court is at last showing signs of life. Four weeks later and Ruth returns to Abbey Door and to visible signs of progress. The scaffolding is up and the renovation has begun starting at the top. With such an ambitious project underway, Ruth is keen to check with Caris that every detail has been thought through. Do you know how much this roof is going to cost? I don't like to think about it. We will... 30,000? I don't know. I've no idea. Have they not quoted? Sort of. What do you mean, sort we're of, a bit Caris? <laughs> you must we're know. We're a bit vague on anything, because <laughs> things are sort of in with things, you know. Who is running the project? Good question. <laughs> well, I don't know, really. We're, I think we all are at the moment a bit. Yeah. Can we go and have a look round upstairs? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you can see the good, scaffolding good. from inside, then. <laughs> I'd like to see more than that. Once the roof is watertight, plans are in hand to renovate the entire house. But with the family savings tied up in the scheme, Ruth's keen that they ensure a healthy return on their investment. Oh, Hundreds and hundreds of books. Good. So what are you planning on spending on restoring the house? As little as possible. And how little would that be, Caris? I just don't know. Caris, I do if not you know. do not know those figures, I am Jack Spratt. I, honestly, <laughs> I will be perfectly serious to you. I do not know. So when the builders came and said they were going to do the roof and things, they didn't give you a price? No, I don't think so. We've... <laughs> All the I don't believe you. Come oh, on, come honestly, on. Honestly, I don't, do, don't know. I don't believe I a word. I don't believe a word. I'm there. not. I can't give <laughs> you figures. I don't believe a word. Of I it. cannot <laughs> give you figures because I am totally to nothing, not sure but of don't them. Don't ask me to believe it. <laughs> I'm not sure of them. <laughs> An exasperated Ruth goes to find Claire. She's invited holiday letting agent Clive Sykes to view the house to get an idea of what it could earn if let. It's a marvellous room. Looks a bit better now. <laughs> it's beautiful, isn't it? Amazing. Oak floors. Um, from a holiday perspective, um, this room, the most important thing, there needs to be seating for everyone who is effectively sleeping in the property. Mm. So if the property is sleeping 16, then there needs to be 16 comfy seats. Um, just through there, we've got the dining room and the kitchen. If you want to go through, I'll show you the rest of it. Great. OK. There's still a lot of work to do, but Abbey Door Court's potential is clear. How many weeks of the year can they be assured of renting out the property? Um, I, I would be reasonably confident um, of, of, of doing, um, even the first year, in excess of, of, of 30 weeks um, bookings. I mean, the season generally runs from Easter until the end of October. I, I would um, hang my head in shame if we didn't do gross rents of um, 30,000 in, in, in year one. If Abbey Door traded as a and b Ruth's worked out that even at 65% occupancy, profit would be around £30,000 a year, double that of the self-catering model. Resigned to the fact that she's fighting a losing battle, at least Ruth is safe in the knowledge that Abbey Door is being restored. I think congratulations are in order. Um, scaffolding, building work, progress being made on the house. Claire, how have you found the process? Because for me, the biggest change is, is what's happened with you, because you were the one who asked me to come. You were the one who were all excited about getting the house restored, maybe having a B&B &B here, and you've kind of rather gone backwards, as it were, in coming forwards. Um, it's been a roller coaster. We've kind of gone up and down, up and down. And so, yeah, we've got lots of ideas coming in, going, and now it's just it feels really exciting mm -hmm. because we've, we've got, we're going somewhere. All I'm saying to you is that Yes, you won't fail with doing holiday lets. I know you won't fail. There will be money coming in and it will be lettable. 
but I still would like you to not shut the door on the notion of B&B because I think you can make more money out of it. Would, would you consider keeping the door open on that? I definitely would, yeah. The major thing has been achieved, which is that this building <laughs> is currently being restored. One year on, is Abbey Door Court trading as a business? And is Caris the forceful figure she always was? I expect Ruth is bound to say, um, how much does it all cost? And I still haven't got an answer for her. When Ruth Watson was last at Abbey Door Court in Herefordshire, the house was clad in scaffolding and undergoing extensive renovations. It's 12 months later, and the historic house is running as a successful self-catering holiday property. The family rejected Ruth's idea of turning the house into a B&B and followed their desires to let it out to paying guests for short-term rentals. Since opening in May, they've had 22 bookings and made a profit of £5,000, which they've reinvested into the business. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. Grandchildren Claire, Julian and Hannah take care of the day-to-day -day aspects of the new business. Claire oversees the bookings and the administration, while Julian is in charge of maintenance and Hannah the housekeeping. The house is now up and running. It's the home we all knew, but kind of the new, improved version. The whole place feels alive from the outside to the inside. It just looks amazing. It's how it was as I grew up and I love that, I really do. The building work took seven long months through the winter. The roof was taken off and replaced to ensure the building was watertight before each room was stripped back to its bones, replastered and decorated. Though the whole family were involved in the project, there was one person who took charge over the vast transformation. The house I, I really did look on in the winter as a job. I, you know, it just had to be dealt with and finished and the sooner we got to the end of it, the better. To finally have the house secure is a relief for everyone. No one more so, however, than 82-year-old Caris. As Ruth knows, I was quite happy to let it fall down. Well, as I say, I'm like the ancient mariner, though albatross was dropped by my neck. It's wonderful. Ruth is back at Abbey Door for the weekend. Tomorrow she'll be reunited with Caris, but today she's meeting Claire and having a look around before this weekend's house guests arrive. It's going to be lovely to see Ruth. It'll be lovely to show her everything we've done that I think at some stages she didn't never thought we'd get to. The first thing Ruth notices is the new porch. Look, what can I see? The porch oh, is yeah. standing up on its own legs. It's amazing, isn't it? It's very different. <laughs> and you've done a lot of work. New entrance. Yep. New entrance, so guests know where to come. So show me yeah, everything. The old hall wasn't welcoming, but now it's warm and inviting. How's it going in terms of the family? You have authority, your grandchildren. I mean, are you allowed to make all the decisions? We can do, but we like to run things by here. We like to kind of all communicate and keep each other informed of what's going on. And any big changes would definitely run by here. In my mind, it's always going to be her house, and it's always just one of those things. And we're all a team here, and we need to communicate, and we're all working together. What about your jobs? Because you're working full time still. Yeah, still working in Hereford so full time. So, how does that fit in with running the house? Um, well, luckily, because it's kind of weekly rental or weekend rental, it's kind of one day a week that we need to be in here cleaning and changing. And then I do the booking, so I'm kind of evening work. You did have a desire at the outset to actually run this as a B&B &B and to give yeah. up your job. I mean, do you still see this as something that you could work full-time in? Hopefully. Like, that's the aim, really, is to make something of here. Who knows what the future holds? I think just kind of get this business on its feet properly. So, um, can I start seeing things? Yeah, I mean, no, the, come the, on the through. The big living room was, was obviously a real Yeah, key, that's our key room now, key room. so, yeah, yes, yes. come on through and see yeah. it. Caris was project manager over the building works and Claire was in charge of the interior design. Gosh. Yeah. Tell me about the sofas. <laughs> <laughs> they took a long time to come, but I'm quite pleased with them. All right. Finish the room. You sound like okay. my grandmother. <laughs> she doesn't like them very much. I think they're just totally inappropriate, Claire. I'm sorry. 
They might work okay in a loft, but I think it would have been much nicer to have had much more classical furniture. Because you've got, you know, very fine pieces with the, the bookcase here and the grandfather clock, and you've got the grand piano over here. And personally, not my taste. Ruth advised Claire from the outset that holiday let properties experience periods of low occupancy, whereas a and b would provide more consistent business throughout the year. If, in time to come, and I'm not just flogging my dead horse no, for the sake no. of it. If you did do B&B and, you know, you gave up your job to do it, I yeah. think you could get... It's the all-year-round trade yeah. I think you could get. But you're enjoying yeah. this. I am, yeah, really enjoying it. I love coming in here. I love seeing it, especially when it's just ready for guests to come in and it's just perfect. And I'm very conscious you've got guests staying this weekend. Yes, and we're running out of time. So <laughs> I'm going to love and leave you. Um, oh, and can yeah. I have a little wander? Yeah, no, do, yes. Yeah. So Ruth I'm... takes herself off to look upstairs. It costs £2,500 to hire Abbey Door Court for a week in peak season. There are six big bedrooms which can accommodate up to 16 people. Ooh. Well, this is a big improvement because I seem to remember there was pane of glass missing over there, I'm not sure, but it does look hugely better and what a fabulous room. I mean, it, you know, I'm nitpicking, I don't know why the carpet's on a diagonal and I think they could have done better than going to an out-of-town warehouse to buy the bed, but it generally looks hugely improved. I mean, it looks like a house that is habitable. That's what we wanted. Ruth slips away before the guests arrive. Tomorrow she'll be back to see what they think of the house and to go head to head with Caris. I expect Ruth is bound to say, um, how much does it all cost? And I still haven't got an answer for her. I've got a bit of an answer. It's the next morning and Abbey Door is full of life with 16 guests who are making the most of every room. Ruth knows that positive guest feedback is critical for the success of an emerging accommodation business. So she's keen to know how this group have got on. Hi, guys. Hello. Actually, all girls. Hello. All girls in the kitchen. <laughs> I can't believe I've just walked through the house. And the corridors and the hallways and up and down the stairs. It's great. It's lovely hearing the sound of people enjoying themselves. It's very good. Have you done a house let before, the, the families? Not all no. together. No, we've no. spoken about it, but this is the first time. But yes. yeah. And what about the price? Do you think it's fair or too cheap or too expensive? I think it's perfect. When it's there's okay, four families well. here... Um, then How much is it costing per family? I think we worked out to about £400 a family. For the weekend? Um, yes. Yeah. So everything's going well? Fantastic. Yeah. Yes. It's yeah. a great place for you know, groups of friends or groups of families like as we are. Clearly, the house is a success. So Ruth is off to find Caris. The beautiful gardens at Abbey Door are still open to the public and have been very popular over the summer season. Ruth finds Caris in her new headquarters, an old barn she had renovated at the same time as the main house, which has become the new entrance to the gardens. Look, this fantastic... Oh, well, my shed. It's your shed? My shed. It's your office, your sitting room, your planting room, your greenhouse, it's everything. It's yeah. brilliant. I it's love it. Shed. I love it. I have to say that I wish the interior design here had been translated into the house because I don't like the sofas <laughs> in the living room. Well, I was quite tactful about the sofas, but... Were you? Really? Yeah, uh, Promise yes, me? yes, yes, I was, for me, quite tactful. I didn't say what I thought. So do you feel now the house is off your shoulders, it's not your responsibility anymore, that you can enjoy the garden more? I think I can enjoy the garden with a clear conscience, put it that way. I look at it out of the kitchen window and think you're nothing to do with me. Come and show me. The cost of renovating Abbey Door was split between the grandchildren and Carries. Claire and her siblings took out a business loan of £35,000 to finance the interiors, whilst Caris paid for the external building work. Previously, Ruth and Caris almost came to blows over finances, and with all the demonstrable changes at the house, Ruth wonders if there's been a change in Caris. Now, Caris, I think I can say with affection that you were implacable in your obduracy about telling me what this was going to cost and how much you were going to spend. Are you going to tell me how much? I will tell you a, a bit how much. Yes, you okay. Yes. Tell me a bit how much. Do you much? want to know? Yes, I do. Well, the exterior, it cost us 57000 Right. Which I don't think was too bad. No, very good. 
what's interesting for me is that the grandchildren still seem to feel that it's your house. Are they wrong to feel that way? Oh, totally. It's certainly not my house. I've barely been in it since it's been finished. No, I, I have no affinity with the house at all. I would like them to stand up to you more, not in an aggressive, confrontational mm. way, but I kind of want to shake them and say, look, you know, your grandmother will probably respect you more if you just get on and do this. Maybe they're so used to me saying what's happening, everybody goes along with that. Yeah. I don't mind if anybody disagrees with me. It doesn't matter a bit. All that's left is for Ruth to bring the family together for one last time. So, it's... Over a year ago, when I first met you, and Claire, how do you feel about all this? Because you were the instigator. I think I got very carried away with the kind of the romance of it all and that I can make it all work. But I have got a brother and sister. I've got my grandmother and my mum. I'm very lucky to be in the position I am. And it's just, it's perfect now that we can all do it together as a family. When we first met, um, my opinion was that you were certainly indomitable, but um, quite difficult, quite contradictory. I could be talking about myself, I know. Um, but I think we've become quite good chums over this and I certainly have developed a lot of respect for you. We were very grateful to you because I mean if you hadn't sort of goaded us onto it we probably well I might never have done it. I really have to say you know congratulations to everyone involved because you have restored Abbey Door House. It's there, it's laughing again. I have to give Karis and her family full credit for restoring Abbey Door, but for all the changes that have been made to it, one thing hasn't, and that's that Karis is still the doyenne of this estate. And it's her, really, that has made this happen. This is Heath House in Staffordshire. Twelve months ago, Ruth Watson came to advise the owners on the future of their stately home. When I first came to Heath House and met the Phillips family, it quickly became apparent where the troubles lay. John and Flavia owned the house, but it was a huge financial burden. They didn't want to live here, and most importantly, they wanted to sell it. You've got to stop sitting on the pot and actually start pissing. What's more, they didn't trust their son, Ben, who desperately wanted to take it over, to actually run this as a business. Because they don't think I can wipe my bottom. I'm back at Heath House to see whether Ben has come back to live here and whether he is running the house as a business. I get a little bit short sometimes when I say, Dad, I'm doing this, can you just, just back off? Heath House is a Grade II listed mansion, built in the Gothic style in the late 1830s. Eleven years ago, John Phillips retired from the family business and was looking forward to a quiet life. But when his mother died in 2002, he and wife Flavia were forced to take on Heath House and all that it entails. Heath House represents work in a big way. To keep it going, you don't stop. You just do not stop. The elderly couple divide their time between the comfortable family home in Worcestershire and Heath House, 75 miles away. We don't live here full time because in the winter it is extremely expensive to have the heating on. But with just one housekeeper and one gardener on site, most of the work tending the 480 acre estate with its 22 lawns and countless rooms falls to John and Flavia. Really, by your 70s, you think, well, let the next generation take over. The Phillips have two bachelor sons. 40-year-old Justin has no desire to take on the house, but Ben, 42, is keen to inherit. For very good reason, John is not convinced this is such a good idea. Everything that the family has had has been spent in large measure on this house and keeping it going. With this in mind, John and Flavia believe their only option is to sell up. It's a decision Ben thinks his parents will live to regret. It is such a 
an emotional wrench for my parents for, for all sorts of reasons, um, that it's very difficult for people to just calm down and think clearly about this thing. Pensions advisor Ben lives in London, where he lodges with his aunt, Anthea. She knows the commitment that her sister Flavia has made to Heath House. Flavia didn't want this house in the first place. That was her wedding vows to John. I will marry you as long as I don't have anything to do with this house. It costs £70,000 a year to run the estate, and John and Flavia are fearful of allowing their eldest son to take on such a burden. Benjamin um, is, how would we describe Benjamin? A he, cerebral. He's cerebral and uh, not practical. He could have good organisational abilities. What, Benjamin? He could have. Struggling to keep the ancestral home going, the Phillips had no alternative but to put the house up for sale for three and a half million pounds. It's increasingly difficult to balance the books. There is no capital left. But two years later, it remains unsold, and the family is in real trouble. After 14 generations, is this the end of the Phillips dynasty at Heath House? We have run out of ideas. We are lumbered with, if you like, a glorified white elephant. Businesswoman Ruth Watson has turned around the fortunes of numerous country houses with her straight-talking, no-nonsense approach. We just have no idea what to do. So if um, Ruth can produce some really workable ideas, well, fine, let's hear them. Today, Ruth is in Staffordshire to meet John and Flavia. Over the next few days, she'll try and come up with a plan to make the estate pay for itself. Bell not working, come in and shout. OK. Hello? And everything about this house is so imposing. This hallway, I mean, is totally magnificent. This was built to really show things off. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, you must be Very Flavia. nice to meet you. Very good to meet you too. Hello. John. Hello, hello. It's yes, nice to meet you. Hi. How do you do? How do you do? Well, you do live in a stunking great pile here, don't you? Yes, it's quite big. <laughs> <laughs> How many bedrooms? Do you know, Ruth, I'm sorry, I don't know. I think that says it all. <laughs> there are miles of corridors, but I honestly don't know. Well, you're in a position now where you think you may have to sell the house. Was that forced by anything particularly? Well, we're not getting any younger. And, John, do you feel sad about it? I feel very, very sad. I am the 14th generation to live on this part of North Staffordshire and the 5th generation to own this house. Mm. So it's a lineage that is not easily forgotten about. Mm. Could we go on the grand tour? Certainly. Come this <laughs> way. Built between 1836 and 1840, Heath House was designed to impress on every level. I can't help but notice that this house has an abundance of furniture. Why so much? I think by Victorian standards this could be nearly minimalist, but I agree with you, it is quite well furnished. Yeah. Our sons are not married, so nothing has been handed on. Ah, so it hasn't been sequestered um, by not, the next generation. Not quite, <laughs> not quite. Well, we live in hope. Mm. And yeah. you don't think your two sons could, could carry on? Not realistically, because there is not a salary here. Mm. Before Ruth can draft a plan of action for Heath House, she needs to find out the true state of the family finances. Could we just go through what efforts you've made to um, produce some revenue stream? I do these weddings. Uh, we did none in 2008 because we thought the house was going to be sold. Uh, in the event we had the worst of all worlds, we had no revenue from weddings, um, and nor was the house sold. Mm. But in 2007, I think we did about 11 weddings. It's a bit faulty task, but we do get there. To make ends meet, the Phillips have also tried to get the 480-acre estate to earn its keep. Could I just ask, how much do you get in from renting out the farmland? About 40,000. But the farmland and the, and the, rent, and the, and the let properties, do you And mean? the let properties yes. together? Yes. So about £40,000. With annual running costs of £70,000 a year and no wedding income, there's a £30,000 shortfall. 
Did you run your own business successfully? Did it, was it profitable? To be perfectly straightforward, we did run out of money at the mm. end, which was bad news, a very mm. bad news, and that was, that was a... So you're kind of used to running out of money. Uh, it has been known, <laughs> yes. One's learnt the hard way that if you're losing money, you've got to do something about it. It's very obvious that for decades the Phillips family had been running out of steam. This is why they keep coming back to the notion that this house must be sold. I think it would be a great shame because for John particularly, it does matter to him, his ancestry and the fact that the Phillips have lived here for 14 generations. But as Ruth receives a panic phone call from Ben, could it all be too late for Heath House? Somebody has put in an offer. So is he seriously considering it? He's got mum yelling in his ear, it's an offer, it's an offer. Heath House is the ancestral home of the Phillips family, who have lived on this site in North Staffordshire for 14 generations. But with overheads of £70,000 a year, it's become a burden for current owners John and Flavia Phillips, and they've put the estate up for sale. Heath House was built in 1836, after John's ancestors demolished their modest Georgian house, which sat on the same site. An impressive staircase dominates the Grand Hall, but the crowning glory of the house is the 80-foot tower. The house has been a struggle to run for recent generations of Phillips, and John and Flavia are uncertain whether either of their sons could cope with the responsibility. Their eldest son, Ben, has come up from London especially to see Ruth. They meet at the derelict stable block, a site that's ripe for development. Looking at the house from this angle, it's incredibly forbidding. I mean, one could almost say it's grim. <laughs> yes, it's, it's got a kind of ghost-like quality from, from this angle. But did you ever feel in the back of your mind one day, this will all be mine? <laughs> I, I do remember as a five-year-old looking up and going, wow. As the eldest son, Ben is eager to inherit the house, but his parents aren't so keen. Why do you think that they don't want to just say, here you are, Ben, it's yours? That is the million-dollar question, and I haven't been able to get through to them on that one. So if a sale went ahead mm. without you feeling that you tried your best to do something, yeah. it would make... I would feel cheated. I'd, I'd feel gutted, actually. What there's never been, Ruth, has been a, a long-term strategic Proper plan. plan. <laughs> and we've, we've gone... What? I'm very pleased to hear those words <laughs> emanating from your mouth because that's entirely what this property needs yeah. and what this property yeah. doesn't appear to have had for about a hundred years. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, I mean, that's With no long-term plan, there's little hope that Ben will become the sixth generation to reside at Heath House in its present form. To provide an overview of the situation, John takes Ruth up the tower. Like his ancestors, he's extremely proud of it. Right, come along, Ruth. This, this is the way. Am I nearly there? Yeah, a bit more yet. Uh, but you can think that you're getting nearer to heaven with each step. <laughs> that's definitely yeah, some don't... solace. <laughs> Gosh, that's a way up. When you come up here and you survey your property, I mean, doesn't that kind of give you the spur to carry on with this rather than sell it? I think I have inherited, like my ancestors, a way of, of, of liking to show off. And certainly, bringing up one's guests up here, and I say I, I own all that you can see, bow down and worship me, um, and they do, and they think it's wonderful. Um, but I think they go down the tower saying to themselves, thank God it, uh, it's not my responsibility. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and that's the truth of all these houses, and that's the whole point, mm. is that, unfortunately, it's always in the hands of one family to maintain something that's actually for the national good. Anyway, this area is um, very exalted for the likes of me, so I'm going to go down. <laughs> False humility, Ruth. <laughs> In a bid to find solutions to the Phillips financial problems, Ruth is on her way to Hardwick Hall, which is owned by the National Trust. It's an important historic property, which was built for the Countess of Shrewsbury in the late 1500s. The National Trust refurbished the old stable block and turned it into holiday-let properties. 
Ruth meets Richard Heap, assistant property manager, who shows her around. Oh, this is really attractive, isn't this it? This is um, high hazels, yes. Very nicely done. How many rooms in here? Uh, sleeps 12, actually. Oh, my gosh. Like Heath House, Hardwick Hall is in prime tourist territory. Close to the Potteries, Peak District and birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, this part of the country attracts millions of visitors every year. It's a market the Phillips could be tapping into. Here we are in one of the double rooms on the first floor of the house. This is obviously quite a large unit. What would you say was the optimum size for a number of um, people? Around about six to eight, I think, is yeah. probably optimum. And, and in high season, what kind of rental could you expect? Um, for a sleep six, high season, around about £1,400. Fantastic. And, of course, one of the other marvellous things is that you can actually see the big house. I yes. mean, how much do you think that adds to the reason why people come? I, th I think that's a great attraction. Having done her research, Ruth has come up with a portfolio of ideas that could generate a healthy income for Heath House. Hello. But first, she needs to convince John Phillips that the estate can be lucrative and that selling needn't be an option. I know you have doubts about Ben inheriting, but you also feel very strongly that you know, you are part of the Phillips line, your sons are as well, and that this house matters to you. But actually, you're the stumbling block. The estate costs £70,000 a year to run, but Ruth is convinced that the Phillips can achieve this by getting Heath House back in business. My solution to the problems are, first and foremost, that you take in hand the weddings in a way that you haven't done at the moment, and really try and get some proper profit out of them. I think it could provide jolly good cash flow. I think this is something Ben could easily do while he still holds down his position in the city. That could produce an income of 50, 60, 70, 80,000 a year if it's done properly. After her visit to Hardwick Hall, Ruth has also come up with a financial solution that could secure the future of Heath House for generations to come. When it comes to a longer term, bigger project, I think that the stable buildings would make fantastic holiday lets. I think you could be looking at 100,000 a year cash flow there as well. This has been gone into in some considerable depth already. And my estate agents, if you like, have poured buckets of cold water on the whole concept. Wow. Saying, because it's going to cost too m a, a hell of a lot and you're not going to derive um, sufficient income to cover it, to cover well, the expenses. Can I just finish, yes, please? Sorry. The cost of turning those stables into, let's for argument's sake, say office um, accommodation for the moment, it has generally been said that it would not cover the costs, that it would be... But I'm not suggesting office accommodation. No, I, I know you're not. It's a stupid but, idea, um, because where are you going to get people to come and, you well, know, carry out business yeah. here? I mean, that's madness. OK, fine. If the bank were to see a proper plan for this house, I think you would get some fundings from the bank, enough to do the stables. But before considering any of Ruth's solutions, the Phillips need to resolve a crucial dilemma. Make a go of Heath House or sell up? Normally, I ask people to do a certain amount of work before my next visit. Um, in your case, I think the biggest thing has got to be a decision. And I think you have actually, perhaps with Justin as well, you actually have just got to sit round a table, lock yourselves in, and work out what you're going to do. Yes, quite fine, yes, I mean, <laughs> there's no well, argument. I'm sorry it's not thing. music to your ears, John, <laughs> well, but, you know, it's... Well, I've battled all my life, and after a while you, you get... You lose you want, steam. Well, you just, just, for God's sake, let's have a bit of peace. If I give you no other piece of advice, it's that you've got to stop sitting on the pot and actually start pissing. What a graphic description. Fine. <laughs> it was good. Um, it is like having a good internal flush out and, and you feel better for it. I think it could be tremendously exciting and, and very liberating and might be the making of me. It is an opportunity to, have, to let Benjamin uh, to start to fly. I could be the hero that Heath House needs. Providing that we don't get... A really good offer. <laughs> 
Four weeks later, Ben calls Ruth with a worrying development. Hello, Ruth. Hi, how are you? I had a phone call from my dad Tuesday night. Somebody has put in an offer right. on the property for two. Two million? Yes, which is 40% below the asking price. So is he seriously considering it? He's got mum yelling in his ear, it's an offer, it's an offer. Ruth wants Ben to tackle this head on and suggests he calls a family meeting. I mean, the major, major thing is, Ben, if I say nothing else, is don't let John bully you. No. You know, I'm going into this for guns for blazing tomorrow. I really think you should be trying to resist it. Good luck, yeah. Ben. Good luck. All right. The next day, Ben and his brother Justin head to their parents' home in Worcestershire to decide whether to give Ruth's plan a go or sell Heath House at a vastly reduced price. I mean, Dad, this, this particular offer that's on the table at the moment, where are we with it? I don't think as yet we know enough to know whether yeah. to give any positive answer. I don't think yeah. I'm procrastinating, but um, that is nonetheless the fact. To be honest, I think that this whole business of keeping on the market just distracts us from what we're trying to do, which is to create a business. One feels we, we owe more to the place than, than just selling it for a song. We've, we've got to cross the threshold and do, do these events because we get frankly derisory offers in from time to time and they are not when they're scrutinized they're, they're not worth the paper they're written on we'd achieve more in two years by doing this than we would by twiddling our thumbs away from this i mean this whole thing is going to take um a long time the days of talking we've had seven years of it and it's got to stop with an offer still on the table the family remains divided Justin and Ben are keen to keep Heath House and make it commercial, but, aware of the family's past financial struggles, John and Flavia feel it more prudent to sell. Nearly three months have passed since Ruth's last visit. She's convinced the family don't need to sell the estate and that they can make it commercial. The recent offer on the house has fallen through, so Ruth thinks this could be the opportunity Ben needs to prove himself capable of running a business at Heath House. As a short-term solution to the financial problems, Ruth has arranged for Ben to meet with entrepreneurs Mark chichester Clark and Charlie Hurt, who run Stately Home Vacations, which is aimed at the high-end tourist market. Absolutely great. Yeah. What I thought we'd do, actually, probably later on this evening, is if the weather holds, then we'll have drinks out here on the terrace, if that's all right. Is that a good idea? Stately home vacations have persuaded some of England's finest country houses to open their doors to paying guests, each property hand-picked by Mark and Charlie. Um, and obviously the big attraction is the view. A lovely um, view. Just during the summer as yeah. well. Just so. the sort of thing we're, we're after, actually, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Um, and, and your bathroom is en suite through there. It's a lucrative business. Parties of ten will pay up to £1,500 for bed, breakfast and dinner with the gentry. Tonight, Ben is to host an overnight stay and a dinner party for 12. It's up to him to prove that he and Heath House are worthy of a place on the stately home vacations books. Ruth is keen for Ben to prove that he can run Heath House successfully, but she suspects that John still has concerns. He's impractical, and you do need practicality with Heath yes. House. On the other hand, he's much more cerebral than I am. You would prefer it if he did stand up to you and yes, did... Yes, yes, of course. My mother always used to say that I sort of bullet bedroom or something. I, don't, I haven't con consciously done so, or it's been the last thing I've wanted to do. My only concern is for Benjamin himself. But he has always sort of felt that Heath House would be where he could, he could really blossom. You seem to now be willing to have Ben give this a go. I don't think he could live with himself if he didn't give it a go. Mm. I think that is what it amounts to. I think it's really good that you have come round to this. It allows both of you to move on, because Benjamin can never hold it against you that you didn't give him a go. Yes, absolutely. Ruth, you're a brick. I like you a lot. <laughs> With the green light from his father, the future of Heath House is now in Ben's hands. But is he fully equipped for the challenges that lie ahead? This table's laid. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Who's opening the champagne? Whoa. Have you ever held a party before? This is the sort of thing that happens, I suppose. <laughs> Heath 
Heath House in North Staffordshire has been owned by the Phillips family for 14 generations. But with spiralling running costs, John and Flavia are considering selling up. Ruth Watson has encouraged Ben Phillips that the house can be run as a business, and this evening he's hosting his first commercial event. That's great. Twelve overnight guests will arrive shortly. Stately home vacations Dawn Rudd helps Ben as the last minute touches are made. Most of the guests have arrived, and it's time for drinks on the terrace. But nothing seems to be happening. Ruth is worried. I'm slightly concerned because um, all the guests should have arrived, right. and I don't think they all have. Yeah. Um, all the other things, tables laid. Yeah. And wine, who's opening the champagne? Right. Um, uh, have you ever held a party before? Forgive me, because I thought... I, I thought Dawn was coordinating it, and there's been a lack of communication as to who's doing what. Right. Do you think you ought to be asking Dawn who is doing what? Yes, absolutely. Yeah? We need to fill those gaps. OK, all right. All right. You go talk okay, with right. Dawn. Ben discusses a plan of action with the Stately Home Vacations team. First of all, get a drink up yes, and running. And obviously find out where the guests are. Oh, right. Give them so, another yes, 20 minutes. So, so, yeah. 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 You, you sort out drinks. And right. The champagne is in the fridge. Champagne's in the fridge. Right. There's um, orange juice on the side. OK. Well, we, we can put the sort of few things in motion and hopefully they might turn up. Right. Okay. Should we go up through here? Absolutely. Ben eventually gets the champagne flowing. I am. Yeah, Let me right. top that glass because oh, the tide you, seems to have gone out. Are you the but two guests are still missing, and dinner is due to be served in half an hour. So, are we still missing people? We're still missing two guests. We got the yeah. champagne lined up and the flutes and everything else. Right, yeah. I think you need to talk to the cook. Right. Find yeah. out how they're doing, because right. there needs to be a point where you actually say these people aren't going to arrive. Right, OK. I'm going a decision to talk, has I'm to be talk made. To ben, now. this is a small decision. Right. Okay. It's one you need to make. Right, OK. <laughs> Eventually, the missing guests arrive, hi. just in time for dinner. Timothy and Caroline, is it? Yes. Hello, hi, yes. Ben Hello. Phillips. Very Hello. nice to meet you. Hello. 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 This is Dawn. Hello. Yeah, do come on in. Hi. Come on. I hope you all heard that. Yes. Dinner is now served. As the guests savour the atmosphere, they get a chance to find out more about the family. Everybody says, if you're a single man living with your aunt... It's a jolly good thing to do. <laughs> and it's ancestry. So my, my great-grand... Great my grandfather with him and my great-great is him. Not very nice person, I'm, I'm told. The whole thing feels lived in, and it isn't just a, a sort of big house. It's, it's a real home. And... The caption is, this is why Mummy won't let me be king. <laughs> <laughs> horrible. <laughs> the next morning and the guests tuck into breakfast. If the Phillips hosted just two of these events a month, they could increase their annual turnover by £36,000. But has Ben done enough to impress the experts, Mark and Charlie? I thought the family were fantastic hosts. They made an effort to get to know everybody, and that's incredibly important. I think Americans would love it. We would certainly want to use it. Heath House and Ben have made the grade, and it's prompted John to make a significant decision that could see Ben permanently take on the estate. The house is coming off the market, so Benjamin does have a clear run. One must be positive that things do work out. And who knows what even Miss Wright might turn up. Benjamin <laughs> can't really get out of now being in the hot seat. With the estate firmly off the market, Ben is determined to prove to his parents that he's up for the challenge. He aims to employ a company to run events, but today he's hosting his first wedding reception, the first at Heath House for 18 months. The pressure's on. Ruth estimates that weddings alone could rake in around £80,000 a year, enough to run the whole estate. To help out, Ben's drafted in Aunt Anthea, his London landlady. Whoa. Oh. Whoa. Hang on to the wall. I, yeah, thanks. Oh. Mm. 
Ben must ensure that the day runs like clockwork, but already there are problems with the lighting system. I don't know why this one doesn't work it now. No. You said it... Did it work previously? Yeah, when I came, first came out of the front door, it was on when I plugged it in. Now it's died. <laughs> All right, so you might it? have to reference your father. It's not a, something to be undertaken too lightly, is it? Having your own marquee. You, can... you need a screwdriver? Yes. Yeah. I think it's good to, to thrust him into the deep end, and only by mistakes will he learn. I don't mean that too pompously, but that's fact, isn't it? Right, I will go and um, I'll go and get a new bulb. This is the sort of thing that happens, I suppose. With the lighting sorted, the stage is set, and Ben is front of house. Hello, I'm Ben. Hello, how I do you do? Right? Hello, I'm, I'm the next generation down, so... I think I've, I've met uh... you before a bit, but... Oh, I think we may have done, actually, yes. Yeah, God. Oh, wonderful. Oh, how... Your wife looks fantastic. Ben might be running proceedings, but John has plenty of wisdom to hand down to his son. Now, you could uh, produce the odd cush, just that, those sorts of little things. But um, you... I know they're bloody uncomfortable, those chairs. <laughs> now go for it, Ben. What, meet and greet? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm Ben. I'm, I'm the son of... John. Yeah, that's yeah. right, you know. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Him. They're kind of handing over the, um, the meet and greets to me now. Oh, well. Must just kiss the bride. Hello. How are well you? Done. Very well. Those benches are chronically uncomfortable. Would you like a couple of cushions? Because I'm going to go and get a couple. Would that be... I don't know. Well, are you right? fun. What about you? Are you all right on that? OK, OK. In the fullness of time, you've got to find your own style. And it's, it's easier to do that if, 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 if you haven't got the monkey on your back. <laughs> Sometimes one has to um, just you do, bite your tongue. Bite your tongue, just you a do. little. Do you odd? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you get soaked? I think last time it was this this end that came off. When a problem with the water supply threatens to disable the portaloos, Ben's on the case. A proud Aunt Anthea looks on. Well, it seems that Dave Benjamin's doing quite a good job. It's an opportunity for him, and he just needs to. Um, make a success of something to prove to his parents that he can. The old, the old man's so tight, he won't buy any more. <laughs> With the wedding reception in full swing, Ben can at last relax and reflect on his success. I've really enjoyed it. I was a little bit apprehensive at the beginning. I think, like all of these things, it's down to practice. And uh, if we can get a really smooth machine up and running, um, there's, there's no reason why we can't lay on a very good show every time. But despite his promise to take the house off the market, John appears to be going back on his word. I was accused of procrastinating by Ruth, and to that extent I will perhaps go on procrastinating and keep our options open, given a really good offer, then um, one, would, one would be mad not to consider it. With the wedding a success, Ben has proved he's got what it takes to run the ancestral home as a commercial concern. But convincing his parents seems to be a much harder task, as they consider another offer on the property. Four months since her last visit, Ruth is back at Heath House, where Ben greets her. In his attempt to make the house a commercial venture, he's created a family archive will appeal to visitors. Ruth wonders if this effort has satisfied his parents' doubts. How are we doing on this business of offers for the house? Dad told me that um, there is one other person and that if that doesn't materialise, then that we take it off the market and we concentrate on this. Can you trust him on that? I, I lost my temper with him because we can go on like this forever. Well, I think... The only way that your parents are going to believe in you is for you to actually do something mm. physical, you know, mm. to say, right, I'm, I'm here, I'm coming here. My plan is, is to move up here in the spring of next year. Well, I think you need to declare that. It, mm. it is a nightmare, parents and children, and you need an intermediary mm. because they don't think I can wipe my bottom. 
Impressed with Ben's newfound confidence, Ruth calls the family, including Brother Justin, to a meeting to resolve the matter once and for all. The problem really is that, John, to date, Ben is not really getting the support from you because you keep looking at offers for the house. So, in effect, this actually isn't a problem about how to raise money because I think that's really quite easy. I don't entirely agree with you. To date, we have only got two bookings for next year. That is all we've got. But the reason for that is because there's always this caveat about is the house actually going to be in your ownership? And while that situation pertains, it's never going to go full thrust. I find it quite baffling that you wouldn't give Ben that opportunity, even if you think he's going to fail, because the jeopardy is so small in comparison with the opportunity. I mean, in the future, Justin, I mean, would you want to come and live here? It'd be fantastic to see the place, you know, operating as, as a successful business. Of course it would be. In, in terms of the immediate plans, I mean, Benjamin is centre stage here. If we're going to put all our eggs into Benjamin's basket, we do want to feel comfortable that Benjamin has got the necessary training and ability to handle it. Because you don't trust that he can do it. No, My point that is, hasn't been said. Well, I think it's very evident, because otherwise you'd just be saying, get on with it. We need clarity and focus here, um, away from the distractions of, of possible interested buyers, because that just, mm. that just makes me feel crap, to mm. be honest. Because mm. I think, well, am I, you know, am I... Am I investing in here or am I not, you know? Nobody is answering the question that I really want to know. What is the harm in giving it a try? There is no harm. So, no, fine. Um, let's let Benjamin have a clear run at it. And I think, you know, Ben, you have got to show the gumption to do this. Could we have agreement that as long as Ben is living here, he gets till the end of 2011... Yeah. ..to prove what he can do. Fine, OK. Going to hold you to it, John. With agreement at last within the Phillips family, Ruth has one other point to make. The only last thing that Ben's got to do, of course, is procreate somehow. Well, <laughs> I'm quite glad I haven't got that burden as well as this <laughs> at, at the moment. The moment. You know what I mean? <laughs> one year on... Has John stuck to his word and kept Heath House off the market? Well, it was never high on my list of priorities. Oh, rubbish! It, it, yes, it was. No, no, ru no, <laughs> rubbish! You. I am no, not no. going to accept that. Ruth, be quiet. Please <laughs> listen. When Ruth Watson was last at Heath House a year ago, a big decision had been made over the future of the estate. Ben Phillips had convinced his father to allow him the opportunity to make the historic property a commercial venture. In the last 12 months, Ben has taken on the running of the estate and is dispelling his father's doubts by making a go of the events business. As I grow into the role, um, Dad can see that I'm, I'm actually, you know, OK, actually, and I, 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 can, I, can, I can stand on my own two feet and I can do quite a lot, but I think he's been encouraged by, by what I've done so far. You know, it gives me a lot of confidence as well. As Ruth suggested, Heath House is now thriving as a wedding venue. Andrew, hi. Welcome to Heath House. Can I put you in very... Ben works with an events company which takes care of the intricate planning for the potential brides. It's clear, obviously, most of the furniture out. The piano stays and you can have somebody playing the piano. Ben's also been promoting guided historical tours of the house. John and Flavia seem impressed with his efforts so far. He has grown in confidence um, and competence, I think. Now he's getting down to the nitty-gritty and having to address practical things. And all your stripes are straight. Well done. Pretty much, <laughs> The old yeah. wobble. Um, and also the volunteers were here yesterday and they've taken down that... John thing. still keeps an eye over what Ben's doing, but recognises the benefits of handing the house to the next generation. Well done. I think the weight on our shoulders is beginning to diminish. <laughs> I not go further than that. Yes. <laughs> beginning well, to diminish. Heath House is some, somewhere that will always have a problem of one sort or another. As I've said rather pompously in many cases, I'm the fifth generation to own this house, and certainly uh, in my lifetime and in Benjamin's lifetime, uh, hopefully, this is the first time the Heath, Heath House has been put to commercial use. 
It'll look really good. I think so. Well done. Okay. Aren't the autumn colours nice? Ruth is back at Heath House, a year since she last visited the Phillips family. Lovely to see you. And, mm. and lovely to see you. <laughs> All these cars. Yes. What are they doing? Welcome to Heath House Historic Tour. Well, it's terrific. You're obviously doing very well. And are you living here? I'm living here. I've left London. I moved up at the beginning of May. That's terrific news. So, so yeah. come and tell me all about Not it. Not at all. Yeah, come on in. Ben left his job as a pensions advisor in the city and has made the permanent move to Heath House to concentrate on the emerging business. Ben's parents had concerns over their son's ability to make Heath House a success. Ruth wants to know if the transition was easy. I seem to remember there was a degree of resistance from your family, to say the least. So, what did they feel about you actually making the move? Were they encouraging? Well, they were. I mean, once Dad decides on something, he, he gets on with it. But as you discovered, uh, getting him to that point, that was the really difficult bit. And I think after you'd left uh, us the previous time, um, that was the starting gun, actually. I know he's an interfering old bugger, much as I love him. So is he truly leaving you to crack on with this and just giving you help and advice when you ask for it? Or is he actually still trying to rule the roost? It's um, a moving relationship a little bit. I think he will leave me alone. He'd like to leave me alone as long as he's confident that, that business is coming in and that we've got bookings in the calendar. Um, I get a little bit short sometimes when I'm saying, Dad, I'm doing this. Can you just, just back off while I finish this and then I'll get on to the, the next thing? Mm. And it's not going to work against you in as much as the better you make the house, the more vibrant, the more people are here, the more he's going to actually wish perhaps he'd done it rather than you. I, I hope not. If he does, well, we shall tell him where to go because, you know, it, it, it is, you know, in the end, it is about a business. It is about generating cash. It is about doing the 101 things that we all want to do. And, um, you know, if we are too busy for him to come up here because we've got functions on, well, that's, that's absolutely what it's about, you know. Misfortune hit the family when, earlier in the year, Ben's mother Flavia fell ill. It now seems that Ben's presence at Heath House is all the more vital. She had a stroke back in the summer. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, um, and that, that came out of the blue. Yeah. Um, you know, she and Dad have been belting up and down here twice a week, at least, and... Is she all right? She's fine now, yes, and she, she's making a really good recovery. So she is going to um, ration the, the, the number of times she comes up here. Right. Well, it seems to me obvious that with your mother indisposed, and I'm glad to hear she's on the mend, yeah. that it makes it more necessary for you to be here, for a member of the Phillips family to be taking this forward, doesn't it? Absolutely. I'm, I, I think I'm the last line of defence, as it were, and that's fine by me. But with all the hard work, Ben's not been able to turn his attention to his private life. What are we doing about getting a woman a bride? Oh, here? dear, right, OK. Day to day, during the week at the moment, I've got an awful lot on and I've just got to bed that down. Well, then bed somebody else down then... <laughs> straight afterwards. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I'm very conscious, Ben, that this tour is um, all the people are, are gathering, aren't they? Yeah, we're and, about to kick off. Right, and you're instrumental in this. I am, yes. So Dad's going to say a few words and then I'm, I'm, I'm kicking off. OK. Thanks. Built in 1836 to 1840 by my great-great-grandfather, it was built largely to show off. I think that's the only reason why they wanted to show off. And in more recent times, it's obviously become necessary to commercialise a house. And so Benjamin has taken on the the owners of running Heath House and commercialising it. And as you know, we do weddings and anything else that will perhaps make the odd bob or two. Right, so if you'd like to follow me, we'll, we'll go off, we'll, we'll start, we'll start. Heath House is open throughout May and on bank holiday weekends. At a cost of £8.50, visitors are shown round the house by Ben, John, or Neil Hatfield, a Phillips family archivist. John died, um, he got married late in life, he died without any children, and so the line then passed to his nephew. We always want to keep Heath House as a family home and, and to keep that family, family feel, and that's the feedback we get from, from, um, from visitors who come round, that it, it doesn't feel like a museum. What's so remarkable is that on my last visit here, Ben was so insecure, he was trying to handle a dinner party, 
being very bumbling about it. But now he's in full control. This is a man who not only knows his stuff about the family history, he's so confident about it. He just feels at home and that's exactly how it should be. Money raised from the tours and the weddings is being put aside for restoration of other parts of the estate, such as the stable block, which is still derelict. Impressed with Ben's newfound confidence, Ruth wants to know how John and Flavia feel. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. It's Hello. very good to see you both. And Flavia, you're looking marvellous, but I hear you haven't actually been at all well. It was very unfortunate. I did suffer two strokes and a heart attack uh, in the middle of August, which was extremely unfortunate. Touch wood, cross fingers, I hope I'm on the mend. Yes, well, you, as I say, you're looking terrific. <laughs> um, how do you feel about uh, Ben being in charge? Do you think he's doing a good job? Excellent. We're thrilled. Ben was doing very well. London was not the right place for him, and whereas here is. Do you now feel that... Uh, Burden has been lifted. Can you sleep more easily now? Yes, I think so. Mm, definitely, because if he wasn't here, we would still have it lock, stock and barrel and two houses and my stroke would not be a joy. Yes, I mean, we would have been up the creek without a paddle if uh, Benjamin wasn't here on earth. How on earth would we cope? Do you actually feel that you would like him to take over? Oh, yes. Were two galloping horses neck and neck. I've gradually felt the mantle of Elijah going to Elisha. So, yes, in, in bit by bit, it happens, but not all at once. I mean, I can contribute quite a lot still and, and intend to do so because I think it would be for Benjamin's benefit in the end. Far from which I'm jolly fond of Heath House, and I, you can't just cut it off like be married to an old girlfriend. You don't sort of, <laughs> you can't cut off like that. One of the most difficult situations Ruth faced when she first came to Heath House was convincing John not to sell the ancestral home. With Ben beginning to prove he can run the house commercially, has the threat of a sale finally disappeared? Do you still have any plans for selling this house, which was, of course, high on your list of priorities, John? Well, it was never high on my list of priorities. Oh, rubbish! It was... Yes, it was. No, no, ru no, <laughs> rubbish you. No, no. Be, that. Be, be quiet, please. <laughs> I certainly never wanted to sell the house, no. But it seemed to be the only option that was left open to us until you came brightly along and said what you said. And you said all sorts of things, didn't you? And I think that was a turning point, the fulcrum of the whole thing. And we withdrew it off the market, as you well know, and it is certainly not on the agenda to be sold now. With Ruth's help, the future of Heath House is secured. This is a family home and we want to keep it a family home and we want to develop it as a working estate. I am pleased that Heath House was not sold. I never wanted it to be sold. All that's left is to say goodbye. I'm so delighted that the house is still in the Phillips family. And I really wish you well. I think you've done a fantastic job, both of you. And I just hope that Heath House stays in the Phillips family for eons to come. I Thank you. Well. This is Plasteg in North Wales. 18 months ago, Ruth Watson met Cornelia Bailey in a bid to save this historic property. I first came to Plasteg 18 months ago and found the most astonishing house with an equally astonishing owner. But behind it all was a real lack of money and a huge suspicion of strangers. People who actually could help support the house were not welcome. Do you consider yourself eccentric? I don't like meeting people that I don't know. Can you not put the cups oh. on there? I'm now back at Plasteg and really delighted to be meeting Cornelia again, the wildly eccentric and marvellous person that she is. But I also want to know, has any progress been made here? I'd rather have the antiques, which last, than spend it all on heat and have nothing. It's my choice, I suppose, yeah.
In 1986, Place Teg was empty and on the verge of collapse. It had been plundered and left derelict. Cornelia Bailey fell in love with the house and borrowed £70,000 to buy it. It was like a cave. It was full of motorbikes and bits of old cars and things like that. It was just a dump. Cornelia gave up her glamorous life as a Notting Hill antiques dealer and moved to North Wales. Since then, she's devoted her life to Plasteg. She has restored the house and dressed it with antiques, reproduction paintings and hand-stitched upholstery. But her devotion has come at a cost. Cut off from her old life, she now inhabits the 30,000 square feet of Plasteg alone. In general, I, I don't see many people. Sometimes I go the entire week. It's a real problem. Cornelia opens the house to visitors for just three hours a week on Sunday afternoons and to ghost hunters on occasional nights. I don't meet the people or anything. It's too boring to be asked the same question by every single person. <laughs> so I keep out of the way. I don't like people very much. But the house costs £30,000 a year to run and with so few visitors, it makes a massive loss. Self-made businesswoman Ruth Watson has turned around the fortunes of numerous country houses with her straight-talking, no-nonsense approach. On a windy day in spring, Ruth is in North Wales to meet Cornelia in a bid to turn around the fortunes of Plasteg. Hello, this must be the draftiest corner. I think it is. Hello, Ruth. I'm Cornelia. Cornelia. Yes. 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 How do you do? And what a staggering house. It is. Isn't this it? is just extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. When did you buy it? I bought it 25 years ago. 25 years. As a years. complete and utter ruin. And just fell in love with I it. Fell in love with it, yes. See, it is. I love these mm. scrolls around the yeah, door. This all had to be shot blast. Oh, my word. I love this floor. They're, they're flagstones that I bought from a demolition place. So what was here before? Earth. They've all been stolen. Everything had been stolen. The doors had gone. So the fireplace? fireplace had been stolen. And also, when I came in here, um, there were holes right up. And you could look right up to the roof. And you could see pigeons all in different parts of the house, in cupboards. It was, it was lovely, all flying around. And there was a stream coming through here and trees growing. It sounds more like a farmyard. It was. And in the kitchen, they'd taken all the windows out and everything. Good grief. So this really has been a life's work. Oh, absolutely. You've done to it. Yes. So it still is. I need to see more. I need yes. to see more. Most of Plasteg's original features had been stolen over the years. The house has only survived due to Cornelia's boundless energy and sheer determination. So how much of this work have you had to do yourself? How much was here and how much of...? Um, nothing. Well, the fireplace was here. Right. N nothing. And that, that, was, that was all. So all was you've that, dressed too. all the walls with I've the fabric? I've stitched all the fabric together, ironed it and organised hanging it up. And all the upholstery? I do, yeah, I do the upholstery. You live here on your own? Yes. No family? No, no family. I, well, I have a son, but I don't know where he is at all. Well, I'm not cut out to be no. a mother. No. Estranged from her only child, miles away from her friends and with no one to take over the running of Plasteg, Cornelia's life work will come to nothing if she doesn't secure its future. In the kitchen, Ruth discovers that Cornelia has a rather naive approach to her finances. So what, what are you cooking? You've got the gas on. What's that That's all about? That's warmth. For warmth? Yes. When there's no central heating on. It's nice. I leave it on all night as well. Isn't that a jolly expensive and not very effective way to what warm up? No, no, I think it seems all right. Really? Do you think it costs more than having a heater? I'm damn sure it costs really? more. Really? Yes. No, I thought it'd be cheaper. And how much per year are you spending on heating? Um... I'm not, oh, no, I think it was 7,500 for the heating last, last year before the increase. Right. So it must be up to about 10,000, I think, now. How do you afford to spend 10,000 um, per year? An old boyfriend pays for my heating because he doesn't want me to be cold. Well, either he's the kindest man he's, in the He's world, incredibly but... kind. I'm absolutely gobsmacked. <laughs> That's incredible um, and very sweet. Cornelia is fully aware that this kindly patronage may not last forever. 
how much money do you actually make out of showing people around the house? Um, it can vary between one or two hundred on a Sunday. Per week or? Per week. Yes. So over the course it's of only a year? One day. So that's five thousand, would be if it was, wouldn't it be? Yeah, if, yeah. if you have one every week, do you yes. have? Yes. Yes. So but obviously, if there's snow or sort of bad conditions. So do you think you do come. make £5,000 a year? I don't know. Not sure. The money just goes, you know, all the time. You know you haven't got enough money here and yes. you know you need more. Yeah. Does that keep you awake at night? Do you feel fearful about the future? Um, I, I don't think about it. I try not to anyway. I'm just too busy getting on with what I'm doing. With little income and an ever-increasing workload, Cornelia's days at Plasteg are a world away from her previous glamorous life in London. So this is like a gilded cage in some respects. I suppose it is, really, yeah. Hmm. But my thoughts, you know, of, of, of going back 20-something years ago, hmm. Hmm. when life was wonderful and fantastic. And, and you don't think it's wonderful and fantastic now? No. What is it now? Hardship? Just, not just work. But then that's... The world's changed. Mm. Alone with her memories, Cornelia is trapped by the burden of Plasteg. To break free from her isolation, she needs help. Physical and financial. Plasteg is a Grade I listed house, built in the Jacobean style. It was one of the most fashionable buildings of its day, with characteristic Dutch gables and elaborate scroll work. The towers in each corner are topped with cupolas and finials. Plasteg was built in 1610 by wealthy politician Sir John Trevor. Its two great chambers, stretching the whole length of the house, were designed to impress his guests. It's said to be the best example of Jacobean architecture in the whole of Wales. But the house has had a troubled history. One owner died in his bed after a riding accident, and it was looted by roundhead soldiers during the Civil War. For many years, the house was used as a lunatic asylum. Today, Plasteg is popular with ghost hunters. Judge Jeffries is said to have hanged criminals in one of the upstairs rooms and some visitors claim to have seen the ghosts of his victims. Owner Cornelia Bailey runs Plasteg on her own. She only opens the house to the public for three hours a week, and it's making a huge loss every year. Businesswoman Ruth Watson has come to Plasteg to find new sources of income and save this historic gem for the nation. Ruth sets off with Cornelia to explore the house and its grounds. Boys. But isn't quite prepared for what she's about to discover. Cornelia. This is my family. <laughs> I have to ask you, do you consider yourself eccentric? Oh, no, no. <laughs> I've always had the boys. They used to live in London with me. How much do these cost to feed? They cost a fortune. Absolute what kind fortune. Of a fortune. Well, their nuts are so expensive. So what do they have? What's their diet? They, they have nuts, walnuts, mm -hmm. peanuts, bread. Mm. Biscuits, grapes, pomegranates, and tangerines. They don't like apples. So how much do you think a week? Oh, I don't know. It's, it's better not to know these things. Does I, the I never... ex pay for the parrots as well? Yes, yes. They're part of the family, so they'll be here for as long as I'm here. That I believe. <laughs> Cornelia's worked tirelessly for 25 years to transform the mansion from ruin into the masterpiece it is today. Over the years, she has handpicked an eclectic mix of artefacts, making the house appear grand and theatrical. But her obsessive collecting is beginning to create problems. Cheap! I have never, ever in my life, seen anything quite like this. This is where eccentricity slightly slips into madness. What is this all about? 
and I can see a doorway through there and I have a horrible feeling it might be filled with clothes. Cornelia's passion for collecting has made Plasteg what it is today. But out of the chaos, Ruth needs to find a way for the estate to run as a profitable business. She wonders if the key might lie with the handful of volunteers who helped Cornelia out. Jill, you are one of the guides on mm -hmm. the Sunday tours. Yes. And, and how many are you? We've got four of us, I would say, at the moment. How, how many tours do you expect to do every Sunday? About two or three. Do you get paid? No, it's volunteer. You just do it for love? Yes. Although you're kind enough to do this, um, if you weren't kind enough to do this, then she would be up the swanee, wouldn't she, in terms of any income coming in? Relying on locals for help, Cornelia needs to attract more volunteer supporters. How is she perceived in the area? I mean, is she seen as an eccentric or... I mean, what, what's the general perception? I think people that have actually been to Plasteg and have met her genuinely like her. If you hear anything negative about Cornelia, it's usually from people that don't know her mm -hmm. or haven't been round the house. With more help and more tours, Cornelia could double her income. With this in mind, Ruth sets off to visit a country house nearby that has won awards for its community restoration project. Nant Cluidy Dre is the oldest timbered townhouse in Wales, and like Plasteg, it was rescued from dereliction. Its success is down to the group of friends who support it, coordinated by Samantha Williams. The local people that were involved in the project very early on, so they saw it in this bad state of repair mm. and wanted something to happen to the building. They've come along on the journey with us really and they've really embraced the house so once it was open to the public they've put on special events and It's a help. formal structure with the sort of yes. chairman, treasurer, secretary, all Absolutely. that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and how many people are involved in that? There are about 90 people at the moment and growing. Right, yeah. And so do you think it would survive without the friends? I think it would be very difficult. It certainly brought the house to life um, and they get involved with all the visitors that come and the school groups that come along. So they've really brought the house to life and yeah. it's a great experience for people. Fantastic. So they really are true friends of the house. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. A formal Friends of Plasteg organisation could take over much of the work that pensioner Cornelia is struggling with and allow her to open the house more often. As well as providing a support network, Ruth is keen to capitalise on Plasteg's theatrical atmosphere. She's come to Manchester to talk to film liaison officer Susan Williams, who searches for movie locations. So, can you tell me what it is that people are looking for when they're choosing a good location? Um, well, they're looking for the uniqueness of the building. But in terms of just, like, logistics, A, it's got to be easy to get to, because you have to remember they've got a crew that's got to get there. Also, the building itself in terms of who owns it, how accommodating they are to filming. Do you think that, actually, the fact this is in private hands rather than owned by an authority or, or you know, English Heritage National Trust or one of those bodies, is that actually a plus for Oh, us? that's a definite plus. That's a huge plus. It's use it to a location manager's ear when they say, well, no, I own it outright. You yeah. can, you know, we just talk about which yeah. area you want to film yeah. and what you want to do. So easier. that's a definite bonus. Yeah. What kind of location fee would you be looking Well, it depends how many rooms they're going to use. Right. For any kind of um, inquiry, whether it be a, a photo shoot or a TV drama, you can be earning anything from, like, £100 up to the, to the thousands. Back at Plasteg, and armed with her research, Ruth presents her findings to Cornelia. Hello, Cornelia. Hello, Ruth. How are you? Fine. Good. First of all, I'd just like to say what a marvellous job you've done here. I don't think it's going too far to say that you saved Plasteg for the nation, and I think everyone should be very grateful to you. Oh, oh good. I'm glad you like Full it. marks for all that. Oh, good. <laughs> but I don't think you 
would be able to organise your way out of this <laughs> glass no, no, you should you fall into that, it. Yes. Now, what you actually have is an amazing circle of supportive friends. Yes. And what it is, it's like everything else about this house. It's very unstructured. Yes. People do it out of love for you, love for the house, yes. affection for everything this stands for. And it's marvellous that they do. I mean, you know, it's a credit to you yes. that they do these things. But... What I would like to do is to suggest that this becomes more formalised. What I'm suggesting is that we have a meeting of as many friends that exist at the moment to see who, if at all, would yes. like to take on more structured role. But Cornelia is worried about bringing strangers into the house, having had bad experiences in the past. The problem is some people come here to help, only to steal, and it's happened so many times. Mm. You don't want friends like that. No. They're, they're called enemies. They are. With a more formal organisation, new friends could be hand-picked and provide Cornelia with the assistance she needs to bring in fresh sources of income. The first idea I have for actually trying to produce revenue is that you use this for locations, both for feature film, television film and for still shoots. The house itself is so fabulous, so exotic. I mean, it's theatrical, it's full of artifice. It's like some wonderful stage set and it has huge personality and character. And you could get somewhere between 400 and 2,000 a day, completely depending, of course, on what was happening, whether it was yes. a commercial activity, whether it was a, just a short ad, whether it was, you know, a big feature film, whatever. But it could become a really good source of income for you. Now, what, what do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, brilliant idea. Mm. The ideal. In the main, they will organise it all, and all you have to do is fling open the doors of Plastic and say, you're welcome. Next, Ruth turns her attention to a solution that will see funds coming into the house immediately. I would like you to consider selling some of the clothes, les vêtements, well, which are it's in diff that It's room. difficult. To, it's going to take such a long time to sort them out. I think that room is verging on madness, if yeah. I may say. Have you been right through into the bathroom? I, ha as, I knew there would be fun. more in there. I <laughs> knew there would be more, more in there. Even more. I penetrated... Rows and rows of fur capes and all kinds of things, fox fur coats. And... I penetrated to the middle of the room yes. and realised that there was a doorway which I couldn't yes. actually even yes. get to. Yes. But as I say, it, I think it could raise quite a bit of money. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, Ruth is convinced that Cornelia could easily reduce her running costs. I know that your whole life is not about administrative stuff. It's not about being practical. It's about fantasy. I do understand yes, that. I know you and do. I'm not trying to <laughs> yes. change you. No, but, I know you know. but there are just a few things that really, really would help on the expenses of yes. this house. And turning off the gas rings is one of them. I mean, just even things like the nuts you buy for the parrots. I mean, I'd like to know how much you spend on that. They're so expensive now. I, know. I mean, the last sack was £100, yes. so now they're having to have half walnuts. Yeah. And they've got to have their walnuts because they like them. Got to have their yes, walnuts. It's their favourite. It's like, I've got to have champagne, they've yeah. got to have their walnuts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. OK. <laughs> it's two months since Ruth's last visit, and changes are already afoot at Plasteg. Janet, one of the original volunteers, has gathered together 15 locals to set up the Friends of Plasteg organisation. Cornelia is too busy to join them. So first and foremost we need um, a chairperson. I won't say a chairman, I'll say a chairperson. Is anybody happy to take on that role? Deadly silence. <laughs> well, all right then, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. The meeting's almost over before Cornelia joins in. Now, Cornelia's the best one to ask where she most needs the help. <laughs> There's endless things all the time. In effect, if you need something doing, you need a list of people that you can call upon to do those particular jobs. Yes, So we yes, need every, yes. everybody's expertise, really. Yeah. Someone that is very good with plumbing, someone who is, is very good with joinery, perhaps. Yes. Um, how do you suggest we go about getting more tour guides? We can't um, ask people because we end no. up getting thieves. It really has to be friends of, of people that are already here. Right. Really. 
Despite Cornelia's reluctance, the Friends of Plasteg begin to introduce a little organisation. They plan to host a launch party in one month's time to raise awareness of the house. When she was last at Plasteg, Ruth discovered Cornelia's vast collection of period clothing. She came up with an idea that has the potential to raise much-needed funds and bring life back to the house. Ruth has invited a team of experts to catalogue the impressive collection with a view to selling it off. Claire Nichols runs Vintage Academe, a London-based upmarket fashion emporium. She's brought along fashion historian Judith Watts and her creative director, Rob Myers. We're going to the clothes room. This is the main room. There's two rooms like this now. Crawl under here. I used to like dressing up in London. Yes. I've always had going to things and things happening. I've forgotten some of the things I've got some. now because there's so many. I'm going to leave you to go through and sort things out. OK, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. <laughs> Brilliant fashion books. People love these. She is a real collector. She's and I an completely absolutely yes, obsessive. And that's she's it. completely passionate about it. I mean it's it is order, but it is there is more chaos than I expected. Yeah, yeah. And there is an awful lot more than I expected. Amidst the disorder, there are some exciting finds. Look, this is this really, really lovely little bodice I found. Oh, it's absolutely adorable. gorgeous. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's about 1905. This. The team has unearthed a wealth of vintage attire that will be sent for sale at Bonham's auction house, making a return for Plasteg. And what's more, Cornelia has enjoyed having people in the house again. Okay. okay. That's been incredible, Dad. Yeah, it's been great. It really yeah. has. Yeah. The meeting with the fashion experts has been a success. But with the launch party fast approaching, will Ruth be able to coax Cornelia out of her shell and overcome her reluctance? We're just talking about food for your party. Plasteg in North Wales is in financial trouble. 25 years ago, Cornelia Bailey gave up her glamorous life in London to live here alone and rescue the house from dereliction. But with little money coming in, its future is uncertain. We've got to find a solution to keep this house going when, when I'm dead, as well as now, but I mean, you know, so it can last forever. Businesswoman Ruth Watson has been drafted in to save the house from peril. Plasteg is said to be the most important Jacobean mansion in Wales, and Ruth wants to capitalize on this to raise cash. It's autumn, and Ruth's arranged for Cornelia to host a fashion photo shoot for the Observer magazine. As a trial, the client gets the house for free today, but a shoot like this could pay over £1,000, so it's vital that Cornelia makes it a success. But the day doesn't get off to a good start. Hello, don't let the cats in. Only the black one with the green collar. So we were going to show you what, what oh, we're doing. Oh, wow. They're amazing, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Can you not put the cups oh, on there? Because yeah. it's a really valuable no. table. Yeah. The shoot gets underway and Cornelia is warming to the fashion crew. Four months since she left and Ruth is back in North Wales to see how Cornelia's getting on. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> hey, Cornelia. How are you? Are you well? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
bringing energy and, and life absolutely. And, and fashion. Yes. And fashion, and all the things, yeah. 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 So you're really absolutely. liking it. And the model, she's wonderful. She's, you know, she really moves well. The colouring's fantastic. You know, it's, it's, it's so pretty. It's like fairyland, you know, it's really good. The shoot has brought some glamour back to Plasteg, and Jo Jones, the Observer's fashion editor, is impressed by what she's seen. It's amazing. It's just having somewhere with a little bit of character, and with these big houses, the light is always amazing in the yeah. windows. The house might provide a fanciful backdrop, but Ruth is concerned that important details are being overlooked. How has it been for you as people, though? Because I appreciate it's really good for you doing your job. So the Lou's, for example. Yes, I think you, you could do with... I don't know what their names are. The two ladies that come in and clean houses would be horrified at the Lou's. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and the kitchen facilities. I mean, you've brought your own kettle, but... Yeah, you we're find... avoiding the kitchen area. But <clears throat> so far, so good. Yeah, so far, so good. I mean, I think, like you say, if, if she could sort out the toilets and have a kitchen area mm. and just so it's a little bit more comfortable to work... Mm. Mm. Um, so it's... look after the principles a bit better because yeah. the house itself is good enough for you exactly, to... Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Cornelia cleans the house herself and Ruth thinks that concerns about the facilities can be easily addressed. Specifically, bar of soap. Yes, that doesn't look very nice, does it? No, no. And, I mean, you know, there's, it's, this, it's stuff like yes. this. I mean, this is just dust, you know. I don't it's... understand how it's got so dusty. Well, I can't. It hasn't been cleaned. <laughs> yes. That's yes. how it's got so dusty. I mean, it's OK having old things. Yes. But in a bathroom and a kitchen, they've got to be clean old things, yes. you know? So yes. I think this needs a really, really good scour. Yes. yeah. And then done on a regular weekly basis, yes. if not yes. more so. Yes. Do you get my yeah, meaning? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The new Friends of Plasteg could take on some of the work Cornelia is struggling with. And Ruth thinks she knows why some of the detail is being overlooked. I'm going to ask you a very personal question here, Cornelia. Yeah. How is your eyesight? Terrible. But I put my glasses on to do things. Because I'm wondering whether that's the problem that I know, being very short-sighted myself, yes. that when I'm not wearing my contact lenses, everything looks rather beautiful because yes. there's this lovely sort of blur. Mm. And the trouble with cleaning loos and hand basins and, and, and the floor and all those things is you really need to be able to see. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then when you start bending down, your glasses fall off. Well, that may be the problem because it really does look very grimy in there. You see, there's the only me to do everything. I mean, look at the state I'm in with, with all the work I do. Those nails are the nails of a woman who works in the garden. Yeah. And those hands it's are the hands of a woman who works anywhere and everywhere. But I think you do have to actually make this differentiation between how you live and yes. how the people who are paying you money are yes. prepared yes. to live. Yes. Yes. Do you see what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Tell me about the money you're still spending on this gas ring. You can't do it. Turn it off. How does it that turn way. off? That way. It's off. It's off. That's <laughs> yes. it. I never want to see that on again. Unless you're boiling a kettle. To help relieve Cornelia's burden, Ruth has instigated a formal Friends of Plasteg organisation. But to be effective, the group needs more members. They've organised their first event at the house, a reception for 50 influential locals, politicians and civic leaders to attract new volunteers and raise the estate's profile. But on the morning of the party, a reluctant Cornelia is still unwilling to accept their help. The glasses look as if they need a bit of a polish. I have checked no, them. Done uh, they, they do need a polish. Yeah, they need a bit of a polish. I've, I've, I've had a look. So we've just got to decide then it's too where. Early to do the things yet now. Yeah, it's um, we've got. To decide where it's going to. You know, I might put a clean tablecloth on the table if I can find one. Do you always go and uh, check the toilets, clean I've, the toilets? I've done them. Oh, you have? I mean, they're as clean as they will be. I'll go and have a look anyway. You know, I mean, I've, I've done what I, all I can do in there, yeah. these things, but they don't come any cleaner. Okay, shall we get going? I think we've got a lot to do. Come on, right. come on let's hit the road. The reception is a perfect opportunity for Plasteg to reach a wider circle of supporters. Without Cornelia's cooperation, it could be a disaster. It's been a month since Ruth was last at Plasteg. Today, she's returning for the launch party. But on arrival, Ruth finds Cornelia unhappy about welcoming a large number of strangers into the house. 
not really looking forward to it. Really? No. Is that just because there's such a lot the, of organisation? Yeah, there? absolutely. Yes, yes. And, yeah. and a whole lot of people. I don't like meeting people that I don't know. Yes. That I think I probably won't like. I want you to be as composed and as happy as you can be. I won't be. <laughs> I want you to be. I'm going to wave my magic wand. Impossible. You will be. We should have had the party <laughs> just for us. <laughs> it would have been so much nicer. No, I, you agree? I want you to relax because if we get all the preparations sorted before people come, so you're not worried about things going wrong, you know, yeah. either people stealing things or whatever, then you can relax. Yes. Yeah? But, but I, I, I will be worried. Well, don't I be can't, worried. I can't. I mean... Don't be worried because we'll take care of it. And Now, what about clothes? Because I'd like to think that you I'm weren't... I'm not getting to... dressed up. Couldn't we just have another top on? Maybe another top. Um, we've got to get people to go at seven o'clock. Yes, all right. Otherwise, they, you know, because yeah. they'd be so boring, most of them. That... Well, you don't know. Yeah. And don't forget, you don't have to talk to all of them. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> As the volunteers prepare for the reception, Cornelia finds it all too much. We're just talking about food for your party. <laughs> and with an hour to go, she retires to her bedroom, leaving the friends to worry about the party. My concern is she's not going to be showing people round upstairs. Well, I think we have to, because it's not going to work mm. if people can't see what's on offer. I, so I, I, think, I, I think some, think some emollient excellent. throughout the day mm. will help. Yes. <laughs> In the absence of the host, Ruth and the friends get to work. Let's go round. But there's one detail Ruth wants to check for herself. Oh, thank God it's been done. New towels, clean soap, and yes, the basins are old and chipped, that doesn't matter. At least they're not covered in grime and dirt. Well done, Cornelia. Very good. On cue, Plasteg opens its doors to the VIPs. Champagne is flowing, and before long, the event is in full swing. The Friends of Plasteg have managed to attract the local mayor, two members of parliament, and dozens of influential locals. Cornelia is noticeable by her absence, but the Friends are busy recruiting. So we book up with you, do we? Yes, or through Cornelia, and, wherever. And you can go on the website as well. I found the tour so interesting and intriguing and I wanted to know more. Mm -hmm. And they were asking for volunteers, so I immediately leapt at the chance. Cornelia eventually makes a discreet entrance and, unusually, is soon basking in the limelight. I'm the observer came here. It was one of the best houses they've ever been to. They loved it so much. This is what it's all about, getting a group of people in who will hopefully be friends of Plastic and therefore friends of Cornelia. Despite all her misgivings, she really does seem to be enjoying it. Kieran too. does tours and helps on the Sunday. Very good. I'm going to be doing the rotor to make sure that there are not four of us one week and one person the next week, so yeah. I'll be sorting all that out. And then we could have weddings and we could have car boot sales, we could have circuses, all kinds of things. It's good to just feel that the house is actually full of life and laughter, do you yes. think? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. But I still, it would have been better with just us lot. <laughs> the influential guests who've come to Plasteg today could help secure its future. Local MP David Hansen says a few words. And can I thank, on behalf of all the guests here today, to Cornelia for allowing us to join you on what is a very special day to celebrate Plasteg and all that you've done for Plasteg over the past 23 years. Oh, thank you. Um, funny, Cornelia, I know this is absolutely not your thing. Could you bring yourself to say a few words to no. the Assemble Company? <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I knew that would be the answer. <laughs> 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 well, Away from the guests, Cornelia does say a few words. So, Cornelia, how do you think all this has been? Have you enjoyed having people in the house, the model girls, the photo shoot, the party? Has it been good? It's been fabulous. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. It's been wonderful. 
I'm I mean, really normally my life is so boring. Yeah. All I do is work. Yes. Whereas I work, but I mean, it, it was nice seeing yeah. other people's yeah. lives and things, other people creating and doing things, yes. which is good, which, yeah. I love, which is what I like. Well, I think you've got a lot of people now who are really going to help, and it's going to take some time, yeah. but I do think that we've got the bedrock now, the first stirrings of a properly structured group of people who yes. will help you here. Can you see that things might be better in the future? I hope so. Yeah. Yes, I think they could be. I want you to come and live here, Ruth. That's the <laughs> answer. <laughs> I can't imagine it. <laughs> One year on, is Cornelia still following Ruth's advice? I know I'm not going to win the day on this one, but <laughs> it is costing you more money than you need spent. In the year since Ruth's last visit to Plasteg, much has changed. Oh, it was wonderful when Ruth and, and everyone was here. I mean, I wish they could all stay. It was, you know, it was nice having people in the house that one liked to be, <laughs> be with. Cornelia is still working as hard as ever, but at least now she has some support. It's like the Mad Hatter Sea Party. <laughs> Ruth encouraged Cornelia to overcome her suspicion of strangers and to recruit more volunteers to help at the house. They have made up the Friends of Plasteg. I think Ruth's idea of getting the Friends group together and, you know, only keeping the good ones, that's worked very well. They care for Plasteg and cares what's going to happen to it. The exposure that Ruth gave the house in October 2009 has meant many more people have been able to enjoy Cornelia's life's work. Come in a bit. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Plasteg. My name's Nikki, and I'm your tour guide for this afternoon. Increased visitor numbers are finally helping to provide the financial support the house and Cornelia needed. We're making some money on the house, but, you know, the house eats up money. A crisp autumn Sunday sees Ruth back at Plasteg for the first time in a year. She's anxious to find out how Cornelia's been getting on. I'm looking forward to seeing Ruth very much. It'll be really nice to see her, and she can see how much we've done here. Ruth's arrival coincides with one of the now popular house tours run by the Friends of Plasteg. And it's 17th century. The two chandeliers. They belong to the Vatican City, and the two chairs either side of the fireplace, they belong to an Indian princess, and they came from Maharaja's palace in Hyderabad in India. Right, if you'd like to follow me through to the next room. Ruth is reacquainted with Janet, chairperson of the Friends Committee, and she meets Simon, one of the new volunteers, keen to know how they've been getting on. And how is it all going? Because we, I, I wanted you know, to, you to be structured with the friends who were here on the ground doing tours and things. It's all been very successful. They're working long, hard hours at yeah. helping Cornelia run Plus Tag. Yeah. And the visitor numbers have gone up. Mm. They yes. have. And they're more yes. consistent. Is it still on Sundays only? I mean, is yes. there any possibility it can be extended further? We've discussed it, but uh, I think Cornelia's not in favour of it, so... Is that because she doesn't need the money anymore? Oh, absolutely not, no. She still needs the money. And, and have you sort of provided that much-needed structure mm. to the people who come to the house and show people around and, you know, really do support it? Definitely. It was all very haphazard before. People used to drift in and out. Now the Sunday tours are structured with a rotor for tour guides. Everybody has a role. The friends have begun to sell merchandise and publications to the visitors. They are committed to making money for Plasteg and Cornelia. Is she appreciative of your efforts? <laughs> I, yes. We hope so. Yeah, we think so. We get a cup of tea, don't we? We do, a and slice cake, of cake sometimes. Now and again. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do it for reward, really. We do we it because, do it because uh, we love the house. We love the house, well, we, we love, love Cornelia. Cornelia. Because she is the house, isn't she? she I mean, she's so she synonymous yeah. with it. I mean, everything she's done to mm. it. I'd forgotten, A, how big it was, and B, just how marvellous a theatrical setup. you know. It's and is that, is that, could it be? Cornelia, are you hiding? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> how 
I was wondering yeah. if everyone would like some tea. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Would you like some tea? Yes, I, I'm sure we'd love some tea, but I was just asking these lovely people, Janet and Simon, about how the friends were going. Oh, that's going very brilliant. well. Yes. And you're enjoying having them here. These ones, yes. yes. Yeah. But listen, I'm going to whisk you away because I want to come and have private chats. It's really nice to have seen you. Lovely Thank you so much you. for everything. Come and tell me about other things as well. <laughs> come on. With Cornelia appearing from the wings, Ruth wants to talk to her some more. First on Ruth's agenda, checking up on Cornelia's vast collection of vintage clothes. Ruth introduced her to some experts who sold a large amount for her at Bonham's auction house. So, Ruth, you can now get into this room. You are right, Cornelia, because, of course, I didn't see the mass clear-out. That happened after I'd seen you, but it raised 9,000? Yes, yes. Since the big sale, you've yeah. had a trickle of people actually coming to the house to purchase clothes, yes. making appointments? Yes, two lots of people so far. Right. Yeah, and, and one more to come. But you've stopped buying clothes? Um, I have at the moment. That's good. But, um, but I might still look for things that I could know that I could well. sell. But as the clothes disappear, Cornelia is filling the room with other things. What else is in this room that wasn't here before? Because this was full of clothes. Was it full didn't of have clothes. furniture. No, no. So um, the lamp was, was bought for this room, the table, the console table. Right. The pair of chairs and the lacquer Italian commode over there, which is rather pretty. It is rather pretty. Yes. Do you think that it might have been an idea to have the ceiling repaired rather than buying more furniture for this room? Um, until I sell a few more clothes, we can't get there. I mean, there's, there's, there's no room. <laughs> so I I've like got to that as an excuse that the clothes yes. can't be moved, so therefore we just keep buying furniture. Yes, yes. <laughs> you are very funny. I have no problem with the fact that you have the most fantastic eye, but I had kind of hoped that you'd stop purchasing and start using the money to, you know, help your life and the house, you know, just... Helping my life is buying the things to... Okay, okay. To make this another room, you see, to, so people can come and see it. Cornelia's obsession with buying antiques is still apparent, but Ruth wants to know if change has been made in other, more crucial areas of the house. A familiar sight greets her in the kitchen. Now, Cornelia, I'm a bit devastated to see that we're still trying to heat the house with one gas ring. That's what we're doing. <laughs> I'm afraid. So you haven't only... changed your ways no, at no. all? No, no. Only, well, I have. I have much less heat. I know I'm but not going to win the day on this one, <laughs> but it is costing you more money than you need spent. The generous benefactor who was paying for Cornelia's bills has now stopped. Have Ruth's business suggestions, like using the house as a photographic location, helped to bridge the gap? What about the photo shoots? How are they going? Have you had any more? Only assistance? one, the, one of our regular ones, that was all. A regular one? Yes. Yeah. The f sort of local photographers, a group of them come. So... And they take all their clothes off and dress up and... So it's actually quite a fun day. <laughs> but did they pay well? Um, yes, yes. Oh, good, good. Yeah. At last, money is coming in. But despite this, it seems that Cornelia would rather spend it on the house than her own comfort. Well, I mean, at the moment, I don't have any hot water. I haven't washed my hair for several weeks because I have to wash my hair down here in the kitchen. Right, because and that's I... because you can't afford to pay the heating bills. Well, bill. the heating bills are so high. Then you've got to be honest about this, because yes. if £50,000 comes in the door, £150,000 comes in the door. If you just see that as a nice source of income to pay for more antiques, more paintings, more wonderful things for the house, nothing's ever going to change in terms of the heating yes. bills. I mean, it's going to have to be your choice, because I suspect that whatever money comes into your pockets, you're never going to spend it on boring things like utilities. You're always going to spend it on gorgeous antiques. Yes, a bit. It is a bit. I'd rather have the antiques, which last, than spend it all on heat and have nothing. So it's your choice? It's my choice, I suppose, yeah. Cornelia will forever be devoted to Plasteg, but with the Friends Committee established, she can at least be sure her creation will live on. How are you feeling now about 
on your demise, which yeah. we hope will not be for a very, very long time, how are you feeling about the fact that now there is a mechanism to leave the house? Yes. To, you know, the nation, as it were, yes. but via yes. the friends. I mean, yes. is that a good the, feeling? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, life is so much hard work. I don't think I want to live too long anyway. <laughs> I'd hate to be really old. <laughs> Cornelia's continuing passion for Plasteg is evident. With a little help from Ruth, its future seems assured. This house actually is in very safe hands with you. It you is, know. yes, yes. You, you feel that too. Yeah, definitely. Yes. yes. I mean, you, you put every bit of your being into it. Yeah. And I realised, really, what I was trying to do is probably rescue you. Yes. So <laughs> you, the house. <laughs> rather yes. than the house. Yes. Because after all the effort I've put into it for all these years, you know, having no life but this house. Well, you take absolute care of yourself, won't you? And you. Because this house needs you. It does, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One thing I know is Cornelia will never change, and nor would I want her to. This is Riverhill House in Kent. Last year, Ruth Watson advised the family on a viable future for their historic home. It's over 18 months since I first came to River Hill and met the three generations of the Rogers family. There was a degree of tension between the generations and how they could go forward developing this house and particularly the garden. You said to me that you were proud of the fact that you kept your mouth closed. Mm. I would never say don't do it, it's up to him. Now I'm back to see how they got on and how Ed and Sarah, who were in charge of this project, have fared. I thought I worked hard in the past, but um, I didn't know the meaning of hard work. River Hill House, near Seven Oaks in Kent, is a Grade II listed manor set in 130 acres of grounds. The listed gardens are of great historic importance, bearing rare trees and plants. The Rogers family have occupied this estate for over 160 years, and the latest generation is Ed and his wife Sarah. I live here with what I call my three Mrs Rogers, which is my grandmother, my mother and Sarah. They're my sort of force on the ground. Four generations of the family live at River Hill. Ed and Sarah live with their children in a cottage on the grounds. Ed's mum, Jane, lives in the main house. And Ed's grandmother, Evelyn, resides in the lodge. She's lived at River Hill since the end of World War II and, at 86, remains the matriarch of the family. Obviously, I've come to the time of my life when I should be taking a back seat. But you see, we can't manage without each other. And I think my mother-in-law has given her life to this place. Mm. And, well, I suppose in the sort of way I have, really. Ed's father died prematurely, so Ed inherited River Hill aged just 21. He struggles to run the estate as well as working full-time in the city. It came as quite a shock, really, to suddenly find that you were in the driving seat just finished university and then suddenly you're, you're worrying about block drains, leaking roofs. It's a lovely place to live, but it's, it's not easy. It's the first Rogers to earn money for nearly 200 years and it's terribly important, but he works desperately hard. He can't be everywhere at the same moment. The spring gardens are open to the public, but only on Sundays and bank holidays for just three months of the year. This brings in £5,000, but it costs £50,000 to keep the estate going. It's a constant worry for Ed, and selling up isn't an option. I'd like to you know, certainly give it my best shot before, before one goes down that route. Can I just interrupt? That sounds so lame. Can you just give a bit of passion of why you like it? Why do you love it? <laughs> why do you really want to be here? You're not going to just give it your best shot, because that <laughs> means it might fail. You've got to be a bit of determination. As the youngest Mrs. Rogers, Sarah is ambitious and recognises that River Hill needs an overhaul if it's to survive. Not everyone in the family, however, is quite so enthusiastic. I think it might lose something of its flavour of a family home if it got too big. It would be nice to get much bigger, but not that big. In 
In an attempt to turn the fortunes of the family home around, business guru Ruth Watson's been called in to help. Today she's in Kent to meet the Rogers and secure Riverhill House and Gardens for the future. We're frightened of embarking on some schemes. Ruth may be able to give us the confidence, confidence to do that. Hello, I'm Ed. Welcome to River Hill. How do you do? Thank Come you for the in. very welcome umbrella. It's awful. Awesome. Hello, Ruth. This is Sarah. Sarah, Sarah. 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 hello. Sarah. How do you do? do. do come in. Gosh, it's Dreadful wet. Weather. Once inside, Ruth is keen to find out more about the Rogers family. Oh, this is marvellous. And who lives here? My mother lives here. Your mother lives yes. here, right. Yeah. And then where do you live? Just down the track, through just the other side of the farm. And so. you have a grandma, I believe, as well? Yes, my grandmother lives in the lodge. Yeah. So can I see some more of the house? Yes, absolutely. Come through to the drawing room. Since Ed took over the house in 1995, little has changed at River Hill. So this is the drawing room. That's drawing. right. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Drawing room. Yeah. There's a picture over there of what the house looked like when my family bought it. For a house in such a prime hillside location, the outlook today is very different. Can I just say that's the first thing that hits me is there is no view, and yet there should be a view. I mean, what is this awful stuff outside the window? Well, the yew hedge was allowed to grow up to... I mean, block the road down I there. think it's very oppressive looking. I mean, one doesn't look at the garden and think how beautiful at the moment. No. In its heyday, Riverhill House would have been a bustling family home with 12 live-in servants, a dairy maid and eight full-time gardeners. Today, Ed's mother Jane lives in it alone and it's a very different story. How much does it matter to you that the house stays in the Rogers family? Oh, Riverhill is very important to me. I don't want to be the generation that sort of gives up on it. Do you come from a similar family? Not at all, no, no. definitely not. So and um, when I first met Ed, it seemed quite strange, the idea that you would stay in the same house. Mm. I've come to realise how lovely it is to have that thought that our children are part of this mm. long line of, of Rogers. <laughs> the hairstyle is even um, traditional now. Is it? And unchanged. It's genetic. It's not genetic. <laughs> it looks very 20s, I have to say, very yeah. sort of 20s, 30s. Kind of. Timeless is what I say. It's timeless. <laughs> it's timeless. Okay, all right, okay. Family values are undoubtedly important to the Rogers, but Ruth wants to find out more. Having met one Mrs. Rogers, she's keen to meet the other two. This is my mother, Jane. Hello, Hello how are you? Nice to meet you. And my grandmother. Hello. Hello, Mrs. Lovely Rogers. Yes. You, Hello. Yes. Do sit down. Thank you. What sort of income is derived from the gardens at the moment? Practically nothing. The, the garden <laughs> barely at the moment makes enough to cover the cost of actually doing it. We usually put sort of one foot forward and about 20 back. Do you have any income, Jane, that you either contribute or are you a tenant here? Do you pay rent? How does it work? I'm just a sort of housekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm afraid right. I just don't have the money to put into no. it. Right. But I do try and look after it. As I suppose mm. really it's been a challenge ever since, you know, I've lived here mm. and with Johnny dying and for, for Ed to carry on. Further misfortune hit the Rogers family when Ed's uncle passed away five years ago. A bachelor who loved the gardens at River Hill, he left a fund of £50,000 for the upkeep of the grounds. This inheritance could secure the future of the estate. The question is, how? I've got lots of ideas, but I'm not very brave, Ruth. Right. Give me a couple of ideas that you've had. We've got some wonderful woodland, oh. and I thought of perhaps having some sort of adventure trails oh. for children, but not done But with here. space for just 30 cars on site, Evelyn thinks that the family should concentrate on practicalities first. One of our troubles is our parking is yes. not brilliant here. Yeah. We're frightened that if we have more than 30 cars, we can't park mm. them, so we think, oh, well, don't bother doing it. The family have been here since 1840, and during this whole period of time, all they've had to do was sit around, have a lovely time, collect plants and have their portraits painted. The problem now is it's the 21st century. Whatever happens here is going to be something of a culture shock. If River Hill House and its splendid gardens are to survive, radical changes need to be made. But will Ruth be able to spur the Rogers into action? It took Ed over 10 years to propose to me, so it wouldn't, there's no rushing the Rogers. 
River Hill House is the ancestral home of the Rogers family, who have lived here for nearly two centuries. The heavy responsibility of the crumbling pile and its historic gardens has fallen on Ed Rogers and his wife, Sarah. My family created everything around me here, so if I give it all up and hand it on to somebody else, I feel I've given away 160 years of history suddenly in one, in one Bosch. Overlooking the Weald of Kent, River Hill House was purchased in 1840 by keen botanist John Rogers, who was a contemporary of Charles Darwin. He travelled as far afield as the Himalayas and brought back exotic plants, many of which today make up the splendid gardens at River Hill. Though sadly, the house and its historic grounds are now falling into disrepair. The spring gardens only open for around 20 days a year, between March and June, attracting fewer than 1,000 visitors and little income. Ruth Watson's been called in to help turn the estate's fortunes around. Through there we have... Our woodland garden, which was created by my great-grandfather between the two wars. That's where most of the visitors go, is it? Yes, that's right. yeah, that's where the, that where, where the colour is. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah used to be a primary school teacher and thinks the key to River Hill's success could be creating a more child-friendly environment. Watch your feet, Ruth. <laughs> yes. Don't worry, this bit's not open to the public. So this is what you refer to as the rockery? That's right. Um, it was created by my great-grandmother. In its heyday, this was absolutely magnificent. It had um, little paths and the water gushing down and sort of a fairy's grotto. Yes, it is. Very I wonder about like. sort of little children's yeah. parties and having maybe Clemmies have a third birthday party. I mean, how much would you grotto. like the garden to be really approachable by children? Oh, very much so, yes. I mean, the, that's the thing. I'm not a really a horticulturist, but I see everything in the eyes of children. I think perhaps we want to retain the sort of wildness yeah. and lose you know, lose the areas which are sort of derelict. Yeah, what a job yeah. for you, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pick up this little wild one. Come on, Clem. Go on a <laughs> journey. Little has altered at River Hill since the gardens were established, and Sarah can see that the estate's survival depends on change. Ed's grandmother, Evelyn, is less keen and wants to see the garden's tranquility and historical links maintained. I've put out here a letter from Charles Darwin to the John Rogers of the day, but they were both fellows of the Royal Society. The John Rogers who bought River Hill was incredibly brainy, and I always say to people, if Darwin was writing to him, as you can see in the letter, asking him a question, referring to him, he must have been pretty brainy for Darwin to, <laughs> to yes. want to ask him something. Yes. What really bothers me about all of this is, does anyone other than you and the family know all this? Not really. <laughs> Because, I mean, this is actually really quite worrying, because mm. if you're the only person who has the mm. knowledge of all these things... I'm very conscious of the winged chariot is getting nearer all the time, you know, and uh, I would love to have more time to write, mm. but one gets so bogged down with just day-to-day -day living, which is unfortunate, mm. really. At 86, Evelyn remains head of the family. And Ruth wants to ensure that this won't prove an obstacle to any potential plans at River Hill. How much do you think you're still the matriarchal figure here and that, that everyone is going to do what you want them oh, to do? Oh, I don't them? say what I want anymore. So you're very happy for Ed to have free reign, as it were? Well, he must. Mm. Whether I'm happy or not is another thing, but he must. When you hand it over, it's rather like when you first send your child away to school. Mm. Is it going to be looked after with loving care? Is it going to be understood? Mm. Because I do think these houses have got a soul, in a mm. way. When the gardens are open to the public, Ed's mum, Jane, is in charge of catering. So that's your responsibility, opening that door every time. <laughs> it is, because there's no-one else who can open it. And do you have to man this tea room all the time? We don't make enough money, right. you know, to pay someone to come here, really. Yeah. Like Evelyn and Sarah, Jane also married into the Rogers family, and Ruth's keen to find out more about how she fits in. Being in the middle of the generations with your mother-in-law still having a voice, I mean, does that make you feel that you can't do things? Um, she does actually say what she likes yeah. or doesn't like. Yes, I got that um, impression. You know, but I'd feel that Ed and Sarah are sort of young enough. They're together. They've got more go, I think. Mm. And you uh, think the house will be all right with Ed as the owner? I hope so. I really hope so. Yeah. 
Being the newest Mrs. Rogers is something of a challenge for Sarah. How do you feel about being the third Mrs. Rogers? I mean, of the ones I've met, of course. Slightly daunted, I think. Um, yeah. The main thing is not to try and copy, mm. but to try and do one's own thing. Um, you know, it took Ed over ten years to propose to me, so <laughs> it, there's no rushing the Rogers. Yeah. What prompted it in the end? Well, I just stamped my foot a bit, I suppose. <laughs> said, would you propose? <laughs> I said, you know, it's now or never. <laughs> Ed likes to be quite sure. I'd rush headlong into yes. a scheme and yeah. get my fingers burnt, but somehow I think perhaps a bit of a mixture of the two I would be... I think you're probably right. I'm hoping it will yes. be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I hope that with three Mrs. Rogers living on site, Ruth's got her work cut out if she's going to convince them all that change is inevitable. As the Garden of England, Kent is rich in profitable tourist attractions. With this in mind, Ruth makes a visit to Leeds Castle, where a popular feature is the world-famous maze, constructed from 2,400 yew trees. I'm trying to find Adrian Fisher, who's the world's leading maze designer. And he's done too good a job here because I can't find the centre and I've been walking for ages. Adrian! Hello. I can't find you! Oh, you'll have to go back the other way, actually. The other way, right. So, Adrian, if you say a maze is actually a puzzle, can we create a puzzle without it being such a formal maze? in a woodland it garden. It could well be, yes. It could, in th the whole landscape could be one enormous puzzle. The experience can be actually quite different visit by visit. The maze is clearly a memorable experience for the thousands of tourists who visit Leeds Castle. An attraction such as this could prove a money spinner for River Hill. There are three generations of brochures, in fact four at River Hill, if you include the tiny tots. Mm. I think it'd be marvellous if you could come and meet them. Yeah, I'd love to. Having done her research, Ruth's come up with a plan of action for the Rogers. She believes that by investing the £50,000 left by Ed's uncle, Riverhill and its historic grounds could generate enough revenue to support the entire estate. But to achieve this, the Rogers need to raise their game. Ruth's back at Riverhill to deliver her findings. Good morning, Mrs. Rogers, Mrs. Rogers, Mrs. Rogers, and Ed. Good morning. Good morning. I think you need to be thinking much bigger than you are at the moment. At the end of the day, visitor numbers have to be increased. You have to have the car park. You have to have attractions linking from the Darwin, the history of the garden, through the garden itself and the plants. What Ruth wants to see at Riverhill is a major children's attraction that will lure visitors and revenue through the gates. She wants the Rogers to research the concept. My trump card is a chap called Adrian Fisher. He is the world's leading designer of mazes. He works absolutely with the owners of the site to create things that are specifically good for here. It's all about puzzles and gardens which attract both adults and children. A feature such as a maze at River Hill might create more income, but the idea is not sitting well with Mrs. Rogers. I think it would take away the family atmosphere of the garden. You said to me that you were proud of the fact that you kept your mouth closed, mm. so I think this is a moment where you really have got to search your soul and say, will I willingly let Ed take on full responsibility? I would never say don't do it, it's up to him, right. but I just wouldn't like it. OK. Ruth also wants to ensure that Riverhill's remarkable history is documented for future generations. One of the most important things, Mrs. Rogers Senior, is the fount of all knowledge here, and you know this. Whether it's the plants, whether it's the history of the family, all these things are incredibly precious, both to you as a family, but also to our heritage. And I think you should set aside perhaps an hour every weekend and just record you speaking about everything you know Yes, I know if I went under a bus, there's so much in my head exactly. that will just go forever. With Mrs Rogers Senior in charge of preserving the family history, it's all eyes on the future. It's now time for Ed to step up to the mark and be the man. Now, there's one last thing I would like you to do before I come back. And I think it would be symbolic of change, and that is to cut down the yew hedge. 
And I think that should be your private little act of commitment to going forward. Yeah. Good. Ruth's findings have given the family plenty to think about. Obviously, it's hurtful to be told it's all in such a sort of state of shambles, which it is. I mean, I know it, I know it is, you see. Sarah, being new blood on the block sort of thing, has some, you know, perhaps some out-of-the-box ideas. Equally, at the other end of the spectrum, we've, we've got my grandmother, who's been here 60 years, and, you know, I think her goal would be that, you know, this remains a family home. I mean it with no disrespect to my grandmother-in-law, um, who is a wealth of knowledge, but she can also... Um, be a little stubborn on certain points. I have no idea what Ed will do, but myself, I'd have reservations on putting too much into it. But I know we've got to put something into it, you know, but I just think it's a little bit frightening. Six weeks after Ruth's visit, and the Rogers are already getting down to business. <laughs> They've got a team of tree surgeons in to tackle the overgrown yew hedge. And they've wasted no time at all in calling in maize expert Adrian Fisher for advice. Well, this is our um, view we've got here from the top of the hill, one of the highest <laughs> points in Kent other than the Downs. It's such a fantastic view. It would be crazy not to include it in the... I think we've got to get people up here. People love coming to the top yeah. of the hills, don't they? And keeping to her side of the bargain, Ed's grandmother is recording the family's history for posterity, with a bit of help from granddaughter-in-law, Sarah. And I thought perhaps we could talk about the trees... Yes. ..and then perhaps go up into the wood garden. I think so, because I think with these three trees... Well, hold on a minute. Let me just start off the camera a minute. OK. Right, it's far so away. Talk about the three yes. trees there, because they are so wonderful, and it was so incredibly lucky with the storm that they survived. Right. But what is interesting from the family point of view is the turkey oak, which is the big spreading right, tree. Right, let me just there. get a shot of that. Hold on. Yep, the turkey oak, yep. Because that came back as an acorn in the pocket of Ed's great-grandfather after he'd been fighting in the Crimea. Ed and Sarah have grand designs for River Hill's new business, and Ed's hard at work clearing the site. But Evelyn is anxious that with the ambitious new plans, the River Hill she knows and loves isn't spoiled. What a lot of the public say is what they love is that it is a family home and it, it isn't too commercial. And I don't want the atmosphere of the place to go by being absolutely overrun with people. So I think you've just got to be jolly careful to keep the balance of that. But it's not only Evelyn who's overwhelmed by the speed of change. A bit daunted myself, I have to say. Well, I was feeling quite optimistic, but I'm feeling a little worried about it all now. Hi, Simon. Sarah Rogers here. Um... As a former teacher, Sarah's convinced that the future of River Hill is all about attracting children and their families to the estate. Um, thanks ever so much for the designs you sent through. We wondered whether it could be slightly more Himalayan looking. So um, I just wanted to really chat things through with you. The gardens are famous for the rare specimens brought back from the Himalayas in the 1800s. And Sarah's keen to embrace this in the new developments. The, the car park you've seen. Yeah. Plans for the new gardens at River Hill are underway but it appears some members of the family still have their reservations. It's their thing, and, uh, you know, I've got to stand back, but I fear for them, that's all. The historic gardens at River Hill House in Kent are in the process of a major regeneration, with the help of Ruth Watson. In a bid to save the ancestral home, Ed and Sarah Rogers are transforming their estate into a woodland experience for children. It's the end of the summer, and Ruth's back to see how plans are progressing. On her first visit five months ago, the panoramic view from River Hill House was obscured by overgrown yew trees. Ruth's keen to find out if the Rogers have followed her advice and chopped them down. Hello, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely to see you. And to see you too. It's beautiful. It's wonderful, isn't it? 
I know. No, you head. <laughs> well, absolutely extraordinary. It's made quite a difference. The lovely view of the, our own <laughs> fields. We and, couldn't uh, see any of the fields lovely. at all. I mean, it's just and the beautiful tree, the yeah. oak tree, and everything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it just looks so much better. Well done. So, Sarah, you've been doing things. So, yes. can we sit down and have a chat? But the biggest change of all at River Hill for generations will be the ambitious children's adventure park. What we're proposing is that we have uh, a Himalayan theme. <laughs> what could be more appropriate? Yet, but we want it to be reflecting the history of the Rogers family, yes. but also make it a really exciting place for yes. families to explore together. Yes. So these are just suggestions, really, of um, ideas yes. which we might um, take to uh, to rebrand ourselves. Yes, and I think calling it Himalayan Gardens because there is nowhere like that. No. I mean, you are creating a, a unique brand. Um, perhaps if I can show you the, the, the map, the car park you've seen, yep. people come from the car park to the area in front of the tea room. Yep. That is Absolutely. the sort of retail trading area I there. I wondered whether we could call that base camp. Yes, brilliant idea. Um, yeah. And then they go up this hillside park, mm -hmm. possibly with a Sherpa pack, with your, yes. for your children, yes. um, up to this area here, which is where we'd like uh, a, a play area. So that's the Himalayan hideout. hideout. We have asked Adrian Fisher to um, create one of his wonderful mazes for us. Right. I don't think I've ever been as impressed by anybody's thought and imagination on a project as this. Oh, I really you, am. I think thank it's you. wonderful. It does mean a lot to me and well no, I know no, it will no, to I Ed. Think it's brilliant. I think it's we, just marvellous. We thought a lot about it mm. so and oh, we, well done. we hope um, we hope it takes off. We've got confidence now. Yes. You've given us confidence. So <laughs> Since Ruth was last at River Hill, Ed's grandmother, Evelyn, has been ill. Ruth wants to make sure that with so many changes afoot, she's aware of the bold scheme. I'm mightily impressed with the plans for the garden. Mm -hmm. Have you had an opportunity to look and hear about what they're proposing to do? Not very much, just a little bit, but I'm thrilled to hear about opening up the woodland and yes. that sort of thing. Does this imply you've been taking a back seat? <laughs> Well, I haven't been in hospital and being at home. I, it's the first time I've come out for five weeks, you see, so um, obviously I've taken a back seat. But anyway, it's their do, you know. Yes, yeah. The notion of calling the tea room base camp because, of, again, of echoing the Himalayas, does that fill you with horror? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's only Himalayan in the springtime. Mm. I mean, I'm all for it being open in the springtime. It's going to be open in the middle of the summer. People won't know what you're talking about. It is essentially an English country house. Your knowledge of the house and the history of it, we talked about Sarah coming and recording. Yes, some well, she started with the garden. As, oh, and up in the woodland a bit too. And did you enjoy doing it? Oh, yes, I love talking. <laughs> I talk, <laughs> talk, love the sound of my own voice. Yes, no, no. That, we all do. <laughs> yes, and I think that's one thing that I really am grateful to you for. You gave the spur that was necessary to get on with that. Good. The maze absolutely boggles me. I mean, I cannot see the point of the maze. I mean, it is a proven model. You know, it's, mm. it's not something where you're just taking it's a straw so and saying, well, this one to this place. But I think we do get back, Mrs. Rogers, if I may be so bold as to say, is that I think you do have to let them get on with it. It's their thing, and, uh, you know, I've got to stand back. But I fear for them, that's all. I just don't want them to get themselves into a real tangle. Oh, this is just that first bit there, Ruth. Sarah's keen to show Ruth the progress they've already made in preparation for the brand-new yeah, so River Hill experience. Just take off the top level there. But this, Ruth, was totally um, impassable. Um, and this until, is all Ed's work? Well, yes, Ed, his brother and, you know, some friends kindly come along to help. The first friends of River Hill, I think. Aerial walkways, climbing frames and tree houses are all part of the master plan. Ed's finalising the proposals with specialist playground designer Lyndon Davis. Yeah. Oh, hi! This is Lyndon from Hello. Plain and Simple. Hello, how do you do? Hi. hi. We were just uh, discussing the plans here for um, the Himalayan hideout. And these two big trees, they're well, here? That's what, no, yes, Lyndon's been working on them. They are Ed. What are yeah, they? Sweet chestnut. I mean, this is again confirmation that John Rogers did some fantastically beautiful things yeah. because they are such fine and glorious trees. And here they are. I mean, when did anyone last get to see these, Sarah? I shouldn't think anyone has stood on this spot where we're standing now for 50, 
80 yeah, years. 50, 80 years enjoying yeah. it anyway. Certainly these are lovely cedar trees here as well, which um, were that's planted, a, a stunning, some of the original it? plantings in, in 1840. So yeah. it's good that people can enjoy them from this side as well as from the south yeah. side. Now this looks really good fun, very good fun. Really enjoy doing it, really, yeah. really enjoy it unusual ones. Yes, yes yeah. No, it's I not the first plan, is it, Linda? <laughs> <laughs> I bet it isn't. <laughs> but Sarah and Ed are saving the best till last. The scene from their very own Mount Everest summit. This is our proposed viewpoint uh, here. I mean, this is just staggering. Is it worth the climb? <laughs> just. I mean, look, but, you know, it is worth the climb. And this, I would say, is arguably the best view in Kent. And the maze is going to be here. On Just this over there, so front. you can Absolutely, look. Absolutely, where that flat area is. Ruth's clearly impressed with what the Rogers have achieved, but she wants to see Ed and Sarah put their plans to the test. I think River Hill's going to become a very special place for people to want to come and visit. And I'm charging you with, on my next visit, to see some kids actually trying some of this out. And I think to see their little faces and have their Sherpa packs and use them for feedback and research. Yeah, get some Sherpa yeah. here and yeah. have it organise a day. Yeah, yeah. I that'd think be that'd exciting. be fun. Ed and Sarah have got just three weeks to rise to Ruth's challenge and get River Hill ready for its first guests. It's the day of the River Hill trial. All the generations of Rogers are pulling together, hoping to make it a success. To tie in with the theme, Sarah's planned a surprise Himalayan guest, somewhat at Ed's expense. <laughs> look, look, look! <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a health and safety thing that you can't do this for very long, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you might be a little worried about your hair. Where will you keep your comb? Well, the thing is, my product does say that it stays firm underneath helmets, so <laughs> maybe it will under a Yeti hat. Two hours to go, Ruth Watson arrives to oversee proceedings. Hello, morning. Good morning. Beautiful nice day. Beautiful. Hello. Oh, hello, Ruth. Hello. 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 Hi, It's all looking very good nice out there. Nice to see you. With lots of yes. backpacks being assembled. Oh, yes. Well, luckily, we've got some nice people to help this morning. Fantastic. And all these cakes? Yes. We've got a sample menu. So Jane's putting on her... Are you putting on an apron, Jane? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't decided. I've got a notepad. <laughs> I like the fact that you're telling people what you're doing and what you're about. That's such a good idea. Everybody is always then up for going with the flow of it. Thirty eager local school children have been drafted in to trial the Rogers Himalayan experience. The event begins with an introduction from a very proud Ed. Welcome, boys and girls, to the River Hill Himalayan Garden. We're so excited that you can join us here today. And River Hill was bought in 1840 by my great, great, great grandfather. He wanted the best plants, so he paid for people to go off and explore the Himalayas and South America. And maybe there has been the sighting of a strange beast in the woods here, so we do have to be very careful. The children are led up into the wooded garden by Sarah to see some of River Hill's rarest specimens. They find themselves transported back in time to the Himalayas of the 1800s. Those, those enormous trees there, that's where we're going to hope to build the tree houses. Look how tall they are. Anyone know what type of tree that is? That horse yes? Horse chestnut. Well done, a horse chestnut. You're brilliant in our trees, aren't you? <gasps> <gasps> Would you like to go and see if you could find that Yeti? Yes! yes. yes. Careful though, Chatty, look at the pack. The 
Yeti makes a lucky escape, and the children make it safely to the summit. Hoist the flag! Hoist the flag! Hip hip! Hooray! Well, it looks like we can actually see our skull from here. Eh? We are. I, I haven't been here before, but I like it. I might come here again. The experience is clearly a hit with the youngsters, and the parents are impressed too. There's not anywhere really around here that's, that's mm. like this for them to just run around and exactly. run up the stream and have a real explore. Mm. So you'll come back when it's a proper going concern? Definitely. The trial has gone well, and Ruth wants to know how the family feel. What a successful afternoon. <laughs> I have to commend you for doing such a brilliant job, everything about it. I'm just wonderful. Well, we're thrilled it's gone so well. Yeah, very <laughs> relieved, very relieved. So do you now feel um, confident that this can work? Yeah, I, I still have great reservations about the maze because I can't see the point of it, but the climbing frame and the walk I think is wonderful. And I just hope that your generation, Sarah and Ed, is going to have a, a wow of a time and that, you know, you will be able to leave something to your children for them to look forward to rather than to slightly dread. And most importantly, knowing that the house and the gardens are stabilised, they're going to carry on for future generations. Well, that's what I would like. Touch yes, yes, yes. yes. So. it would be wonderful. 18 months later, and has the business at Riverhill got off to a successful start? I think it's quite fair to say that this particular part isn't her favourite. I still have doubts, and I think it's an extravagance. It's been 12 months since Ruth left the Rogers family at Riverhill House, as they were on the brink of an exciting adventure. Ed and Sarah's plans to create the Himalayan gardens have been realised. By investing the £50,000 from the fund left by Ed's uncle, as well as money from a local grant, the historic grounds have been transformed into a unique children's experience. The once poor visitor numbers have risen from just 1,000 in previous years to 12,000 in the first season, generating a turnover of £100,000. We had a lot of plans ahead of us. We worked um, all through the winter with planners and developing schemes. I'm amazed at what has been achieved, really. It, it has undoubtedly been very hard work. Ed keeps getting recognised on the station and uh, in the office as the Yeti. I think most importantly, Ruth has given us a huge amount of confidence to actually enact what we've done this year. She just gave us a pretty good kick up the backside. Ruth told us to aim high, and we've followed that advice. She said, if you're serving coffee, serve the best coffee. If you're making scones, make the best scones. And there's no reason why even small things that we do can't be done in the best way possible. And life has been busy for Ed and Sarah elsewhere. The most exciting news was in May when our fourth child was born. I thought I worked hard in the past, but um, I didn't know the meaning of hard work. It's nearing the end of River Hill's opening season, and Ruth's come back to visit Ed and Sarah, keen to catch up on their developments. Hello, good morning. Welcome to River Hill. Thank you. It looks very professional. <laughs> she finds four generations of the Rogers family at the new cafe. Hello. Oh, yeah. Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> this is a new Baby addition. Yes. Hello. How have you managed to do all of this when you've been so busy? How are you all doing? Very well. Very well. Yes, yeah. It's a never a dull moment, really. Wow. Very busy year. I'm <laughs> so impressed year. with the car park and the signs. It's been very busy, yeah. And Mrs. Rogers, how have you found it? Well, I think it's amazing. It's wonderful. And Jane, the tea rooms, I mean, look at the front of it, it's fantastic. Ruth, it's not a tea room, it's a cafe. Cafe, <laughs> cafe, sorry, sorry, Jane, the cafe. Yes, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Um, it's been very, very busy, very successful. There are things for me to see, like Himalaya, oh, we'd love to, oh, we'd love to we'd show love you to up show in the you woods. Around. Well, so, I'd better give this little bundle to okay, Granny. Okay, yes. Yeah. I'll catch up with you later, yeah, yes, maybe. yeah, good. See you later. Yeah, that was funny, wasn't it? In just 12 months, Ed and Sarah have transformed River Hill into a professional enterprise by developing the gardens. Oh, this is terrific. Isn't it great? 
Yeah, great. Yeah. It's fitted in really well with That's the trees and everything. When I was here on my last visit, this was all being cleared, and you mentioned that there were trees that people hadn't seen for... Yes. Well, well, about 80 years, I think, and, um, yeah, people hadn't been here for 80 years, and now it's... Yeah, one of our busiest areas. It's um, great to feel it's being used, I think. Can we put some more on? Ed's time is still split between River Hill and his job in the city, but he feels that his efforts now will pay off in the long run. If I think of future generations, what I would like my children to inherit is a historic garden and house that is self-sufficient and they don't have to feel, oh, we've got to be earning X tens of thousands a year just to keep the central heating on. They've made a profit of £20,000 which they are investing back into the estate to continue the restoration of other parts of the garden and the house. And now we've made a start with the tree house. It would be lovely to put some other bits and pieces in here so that we can make a really exciting area before children go up to the viewpoint. And the viewpoint is the part where I nearly died, my lungs collapsed. <laughs> and that's where we're going. On Ruth's advice, Ed and Sarah employed expert Adrian Fisher to design them the maze. It's been planted with 1,650 yew tree saplings. The posts and rails mean that the children can enjoy fathoming the twists and turns while the young trees grow. I don't think I have to ask whether the maze is popular. <laughs> no, <laughs> they absolutely love it. Obviously, your grandmother had some firm opinions about what the garden should and shouldn't have done to it. I think it's quite fair to say that this particular part isn't her favourite. The changes we've really made this year haven't really affected the garden as such. You know, this is on the outskirts of the garden. The play equipment is using an area that wasn't used before. So you know, we haven't sort of changed the substance of the garden and that's very much what we want to restore in the future. Ed and Sarah have had to tread gently with their innovative ideas so as not to upset the older generations of Rogers. No one has felt this pressure more than Sarah. Sometimes I've had to suggest things which, you know, my mother-in-law, my grandmother-in-law haven't thought was a good idea. You do have to take a bit of a deep breath, but I've got but, quite good at taking deep well, breaths. <laughs> and you're very, very diplomatic, but has anyone actually ever apologised to you for perhaps getting you wrong in something you've said or wanted to do? I don't think. We haven't really had too many fallings out. It's just yeah. more sort of... Differing of opinion. Yeah. So. I think we need to go onwards and literally upwards. Upwards, quite right. right. We've got a special event on today, Ruth. Oh, okay, Come good, this way. good. Yep. Even though the Himalayan gardens are proving successful, Ed and Sarah are thinking of ways in which they can take their new business even further. They've been trialling new activities, such as a mobile climbing tower which they plan to introduce to next season's calendar. Oh, that looks such fun. <laughs> Ruth recognises that Ed and Sarah's hard work in the gardens has paid off. But there have also been improvements in the cafe and gift shop. It's a professional operation with some appropriate River Hill souvenirs. And it's turned over enough money to allow Ed's mother, Jane, to employ staff, so she no longer runs it alone. Hello. So, I've had a very exciting time up there. It's all looking amazing. Oh, good, yeah, good. Very good. And how is this going? Because it just looks beautiful. The cakes look beautiful, the shop, everything. That's uh, great. Well, it's gone extremely well. Yes. Very well. A great facelift, isn't it? <laughs> Tell me about how you feel the gardens going, and Ed and Sarah particularly, because they've obviously worked so hard, and with the new baby as well. I know, I know. Are you proud of them? I am, I am, actually, because I, I realise it's jolly hard work. And your mother-in-law, Mrs Rogers, she seems to be really enjoying it as well. Yes, I think she is. I think she finds it a little bit much when there's quite a lot of children here, which some days there could be thousands of buggies, thousands of small children. But after all, it's the children that bring the grown-ups. Is, is this been a big change in your life? I think it has been a big jump from three months, um, one day a week, to um, is it five days a week for six months. But I think it's right. It's certainly right. And even people have suggested that we're open the whole week. I said, come on, give us a chance. <laughs> the changes at River Hill have been significant and will help secure its future as a family home. Before she meets with Mrs Rogers, Ruth commends Ed and Sarah on their achievements. 
Ed, I seem to recall that at some stage I said you had to step up and be the man. Do you feel that you would have actually fulfilled this quite as quickly, as efficiently without your darling Sarah? No, I don't think I would have done at all. You know, I might have got there eventually, but um, I think you know, she's definitely been the fighting force there. Do you feel that your role here has been validated by the success of River Hill Himalayan Gardens? Yes. I feel that now I've contributed something to River Hill and therefore I've got the right to feel that this is my home now. For me, you are a fantastic team and, you know, you deserve every plaudit going. I'm really proud of what you've achieved and I just hope... I don't need to hope, actually. I'm absolutely certain this will be a thrilling success. All that remains is for Ruth to see Mrs Rogers, who was always unsure of expansion at River Hill. I'm so impressed with what the family have achieved here. What I have to say is your experience gave Ed the courage to invest a lot into it. And I'm very grateful for that because he wouldn't have dared do it without your, you know, your encouragement. Have you personally been troubled by the fact that the numbers have gone from 1,000 to 10,000 visitors? Oh, no, I'm, of course I'm pleased. Of course I'm pleased with that, yes. I have to be very, very careful crossing the drive because there are so many cars coming down. Every time they come down, I think, well, that's money and we need it. That's you know. such a super reaction. I'm very pleased you feel that way about it. You had grave doubts about the value of putting a maze in. How do you feel about that now? I still have doubts because they've given themselves a labour-intensive thing, which is going to be labour-intensive always. I just feel it's totally foreign to River Hill, and I think it's an extravagance when there's so much that needs doing near the house. The inspired thing here has, has really been opening up that woodland, and I think it's been a terrific draw. The little boys, they all come down carrying a stick. Ed thinks it's marvellous. He wanted the undergrowth cleared. The little boys are doing it for him, you know. <laughs> Every little boy who goes up there comes down with a stick. <laughs> Mrs Rogers was concerned that Ed and Sarah's plans would change the family feel of River Hill. Ruth wants to know if her worries have eased. Do you think Ed and Sarah have done right by this house and garden? I think they've probably been its salvation. I've only been worried that it wouldn't work and they'd lose money on it. That's what's frightened the life out of me, you know. But, but you're not frightened anymore? Not really, no. I just keep my fingers crossed. Long may it last, but I think they've, it's kicked off to an amazing start. And I think they may have saved the place. I think they probably have. It's rather wonderful. <laughs>